Okay, welcome back, everybody. How are we all doing today? Happy April 1st. Uh, I don't really have anything planned this year. You know, normally I have something for April Fool's Day. Last year I did a video. Uh, well, actually, I mean, if you want to argue last year was an April Fool's Day video, I basically made a video talking about how Usopp would defeat every single villain in One Piece if he had enough prep time, which honestly I don't really think is that absurd. You know, if Usopp... Hey, listen... If Usopp had enough time to create a sea prism chainsaw, could he not kill Eneru? Like, it's right there. I mean, you tell Usopp, hey, you gotta beat um, Akainu, and you have one year to prepare, and here's all of Akainu's abilities, here's everything he can do, and you give Usopp one year? I think Akainu's gonna be dead come New Year's Eve, you know what I mean? Like, I think it's gonna happen. I think we all know that. We all are aware of that. But this year, I didn't really have... I didn't really come up with anything. I'm sorry about that. I guess I dropped the ball on this one, really. Um, getting us through the break. Yes, the, the great One Piece drought. It's not really a great One Piece drought. I, I think we're going to have at least a break a month... A one-month break every year moving forward, which I think is good because Oda needs a rest. Uh, we might even get multiple months in a year. I don't know. At, at any rate, it... it prolongs one piece further so i'm okay with that um hope you didn't get fooled today no i didn't get fooled today really then again i didn't really do much today i woke up i went to the gym i got food i came home i ate lunch i um just played uh just like just a little bit of my i'm actually playing um well i finished persona 3 but i'm like redoing it because like new game plus so i'm doing that and then i'm doing this now so that's pretty much it yeah um how was Easter? Easter, so, like, I'm not super religious to begin with, and my family always, um, it was, uh, because we're on, like, the Ukrainian calendar, uh, our Easter would always be a different day, so this Easter, I, like, I usually forget when this Easter's around, uh, but yesterday my mom came up and we went out to eat at Olive Garden, that was what we did yesterday, so it was an okay Easter, I guess. And both my grandparents, they're, they're no longer with us, and we would always go down their house for Thanksgiving dinner, and all my extended family kind of live out of state, so it's like, I don't think I'll be celebrating Easter a lot in the future, but it's fine. Um, but I, I had a good day. It was an okay Sunday. It was an okay Sunday. Uh, Olive Garden goes crazy. It's been a while since we had Olive Garden. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. We got there right before, like, everybody got out of church, so as soon as we were leaving, all the people were coming in after church service, so we got, like, there at, like, the perfect time. It was not that many people in the uh, Olive Garden. We ate, we were leaving, and everybody else was coming in. Uh, it's not called the Ukrainian calendar, but it's, it's a different calendar, basically, that's, like, two weeks off from the normal calendar most people use. Like, Christmas, for me... Well, at least the way I always practiced it growing up was January 7th. So it's like two weeks after December 25th. Now, that doesn't mean we celebrate on January 7th because on that calendar, it is December 25th. It's just converting from that calendar to the normal calendar. It's January 7th. Also, New Year's is not until January 14th on that calendar. So, you know, it's it gets a little confusing. We're not here to talk about calendars. We're here to... What, what are we doing today? We're doing a tier list. Okay. So, uh, this is going to be a fun tier list. I'm really excited for this one, actually. Let's, let's, let's push it over to the tier list. On April 1st, uh, this is a great tier list we got over here. We got Best Girl in All of One Piece. Now, this is a really difficult tier list. I got I know we have a lot of contenders here. We have Robin, then 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 we have Robin, and we got a bunch of other Robins, a bunch of very unique characters here. So let's just get started. We got a lot of characters to get through today. First character up, I'm gonna put Robin. Uh you know what? Let's not start super high yet, because I don't really know how these are all gonna go down. I'm gonna put her right in the middle, best girl. Next up, we have Robin again. You know, Robin is a very fascinating character to me. I really like Robin. I would say th I would say she ranks a little bit higher than Robin in that regard. In that regard. Now, the third Robin. Now, the thing about Robin is that she's a little bit better, but not quite as good as this other Robin. <sighs> oh, man, this is tough. Like, low best girl or maybe high best girl? I don't... You know what? I'm going to make a new... I'm going to make a new row. I'm going to make a new row because that's the only way that I can make this work. Hold on. Let me put this other. Okay. I'm going to say best girl. 
right here and uh yeah there there we go there we go okay now all right now that that makes way more sense that that is shaping up to be pretty good i'm a lot more confident with that there um <laughs> put robin higher <laughs> We just started the tier list, guys. We just started the tier. Okay. All right. We're not. The entire video is not just that. I'm like, <laughs> tech. I could have kept going with this. I could have kept going for two hours. Like, I could have. I could have done it. But like, I, I. I love April Fool's videos. But at the same time, when I click on an April Fool's video that is an April Fool's video, and that's all it is, I'm like, man, I really wish it was the real thing. So. We're, we're not going to do the whole damn video. Although, just let you be known I very well could have. All right. All right. So, what are we doing today? Well, we have an actual tier list. Let me bring it over. Let me bring it on over. All right. All right. Here's the cover page tier list. I guess if you want to do that sort of thing. All right. Now, this one's a little bit more, uh, well, let me see if I can mess around with the aspect ratio, because there's not, there's not as many, uh, cover series. I think there's only, well, I guess we can count. I think there's 17 or 18 of them. So let's, let's, little bit of a, let's do a little bit of this. That's a little bit, that's eh, a little bit too distorted. I think that's okay. Let's add, let's make it look nice. Let's do a little bit of a border to it. Okay, there we go. I'll do that. You could just check out Chopper down there. Just check out all the Straw Hats legs down there. I kind of wish I kind of wish there was something to put down here in the corner. Otherwise, it just looks kind of bland. I don't know, guys. What what are we putting down here in the corner? I'll put something down here. Just tell me what to put down here. I don't even care. I can look up an image of something and I'll put it down here. <laughs> um something. Yeah. Uh, let's see, let's, running Robin, some kind of Robin, uh, some kind of straw hat, like, gif, maybe. Yeah, Robin, just put, yeah, Robin, teching, goddamn, I'm just like, okay, alright, well, hold on a second. Uh, Robin, let's see here, what do we got here? I just typed in Robin PNG into Google, and I mostly got, okay, alright, okay, cool, yeah, we could do that, we could, yeah, sure, why not? I typed in, you guys, you guys told me to put Robin down here, well... I mean, here you go. Yep. There he is. There he is. I put Robin down there. There you go. You guys told me to put Robin down there. So, there's Robin. All right. <laughs> uh, there's 23 cover stories per the wiki. Okay, well, there, there's that. That's how many are on there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. No, there's not. No, nah, there's, there's not. Okay. There is maybe more if you include, like, each of, like, the Straw Hat separation serials as their own thing. I'm not doing that. Um, I guess in theory I could have, but we're too late for that now. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> that was the first result. It, it was for me when I typed in Robin PNG image into Google. That was actually the first result was Robin from Teen Titans Go. <laughs> Don't be so childish. All right, fine. I won't be childish. If I'll put Robin in the in the video, then we'll we'll go from Teen Titans. We'll go from the real Teen Titans. Oh god, his eyes! Oh no, his eyes! <laughs> that actually looks. Oh, that looks kind of. Oh, that looks cool when I put it with the uh, the border. He just looks like. Yeah. Hey man, how you doing? <laughs> he looks. He looks super chill down there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just do that. We'll do that the entire time. Yeah, that's good. I just needed something to put down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, great. All right. Um, <laughs> he's cool. That's cool, Robin. It's like, hey, how you guys doing? How you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> how does that work? His eyes are transparent for some reason, which is how the image file showed out, and the border behind it just makes him look like that. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's begin, okay? The first one, we're just going to go in chronological order with these. The very first one we have is Buggy, and this is Buggy's epic journey to go back to his place of... He's trying to find his body. After Luffy blasted his body off at uh, Orange Town, he was kind of missing a torso and various appendages don't really know if he had a penis either. Like, Luffy might have also blasted that thing away, so not really sure how that would have worked. Um, but 
We have the epic adventure of Buggy as he's off. To, that's what I can put in the center. I can put the one we're talking about in the center right there. That's perfect. Okay. All right, so Buggy's Adventure. Uh, this is actually one of the few ones that actually does get animated. Uh, Diary of Kobe Meppo gets animated. Uh, Wapples Omnivorous Hurrah kind of gets animated. Uh, yeah, so uh, Buggy goes on a bunch of wacky adventures. He, you know, There's a bird that attacks him. He eventually runs into Sexy Alveda. We actually didn't know it was Sexy Alveda when, f when she first shows up. She like, like He's getting attacked by a crab, and then Al this sexy pirate lady shows up and shoots the crab in the face and like picks up Buggy and takes him off. And we actually do not know that it's Alveda. That actually was not revealed until Logtown that the woman that saved Buggy in the cover story was Alveda, okay? Now, I just, I really just want to stop for a moment and, like, appreciate the fact that Oda does these. I understand there are a lot of extra work, which is probably why a lot of other mangakas don't do them. And the idea is that after a villain is defeated by the Straw Hats and defeated by Luffy, because it's usually primary antagonist, although not always, the fact is they still have a story to tell. It's not just like Buggy is this one-off character that was defeated by Luffy and nothing happens to him after that. I love the idea of Oda exploring, like, hey, what happened to these characters after they... Like, like if Luffy was, sh like, bloodthirsty, like, if Luffy was, like, the guts of Berserk going around just murdering every single principal antagonist it's just like yeah okay we don't have to worry about that but here it's like their stories continue and it's always fascinating to see what happens next right uh buggy did not lose he let luffy win okay that is true i apologize okay so for this one though i i gotta be honest with you for the first one it was okay for me i'm honestly gonna put it into pretty solid I was debating at first to make the different tiers how relevant they were to the story, but that might get a little bit confusing, like, because they're technically all relevant to the story, but how relevant, you know? Some are relevant for one specific character, some are relevant to set up a story arc, and some are super relevant. Like, Enaru's cover story, I think, is going to be relevant to, like, the ultimate endgame world building of One Piece, because what Enaru's stuff entails is absurd. Okay, but I'm putting that one in pretty solid right now. Uh, after meeting up with Alvita, they find uh, the Buggy Pirates. The Buggy Pirates are actually in the interim. I think they had a little bit of a tournament to see who would become the new captain. And it actually turned out to be Richie because I think Richie just beat up the other ones like Kabaji and Moji, which makes sense. It's like, hey, guys, let's see who's going to be our new captain. Who's it going to be? The giant lion? And it's like the giant lion wins. So Richie becomes the new captain for a little while. They all end up getting captured by this tribe of, like, cannibals, and they're all about to get eaten. And then that's when Alvita and, and Buggy show up, and they save the day, and Buggy's finally reunited with his body. Alvita joins the crew, and then they begin to... Then that leads into Logtown. That leads into how Buggy shows up at Logtown, right? Um, yeah. So, next up, we have... And I, I could change these as well. I just want to see how they go. You, you notice, like, I didn't really put... Because there's none on here that I would consider, like the worst thing ever or something like this is an awful garbage of a cover series like there's there's are all good like i really can't think of any cover series i in particularly hated that was like awful that was like oh my god oda why did you focus on this character like i can't think of any of them so the worst that's gonna be for me is just and eh, not my favorite kind of thing and that's that's the worst we're getting today um, just woke up. Well, good morning to ye. Good morning to ye. Welcome to me pirate stream on August, not August, April 1st. Uh, where is Gaimon's story? Gaimon's story is going to be, it's going to be difficult to rank the, the, uh, decks of the world, but we'll get to that when we get to that, actually. I think there's only one place to really put decks of the world. Uh, I can't put every single one because, like, there's, like, 50 of them, but, yeah. So, next up, we have... And I guess I'll, I'll put it up here as we continue to talk about these to see which one. Okay, so next up, we're going to do The Diary of Kobe Meppo. Uh, oh, by the way, Helmeppo is a smoker. Uh, I hope he quits smoking. I, I hope Helmeppo quits smoking and, you know, when he joins S.W.O.R.D. Because, you know, that's not great when you're trying to be like a secret agent and stuff, you know. Anyway, so uh, this is another one that got animated in two episodes uh, in between... I think it was in between uh, Reverse Mountain and Whiskey Peak, or Whiskey Peak. I think it was Whiskey Peak and Little Garden. I think Whiskey Peak and Little Garden. And this was animated. Two episodes. Uh, also introduced Bogart's name in those episodes. Like, Bogart's name was not in the manga. It actually was shown for the first time in the anime, oddly enough. But anyway, um, 
This is a good one. This is a really good one. It picks up right where uh, Shellstown left off. So Kobe and Helmeppo are working as chore boys at that base under Ripper. Um, they have a little bit of a, like every now and then on their breaks, they'll go out and like have a picnic with Rika. Rika's the little girl that made the rice balls. And so Kobe and her will have like a light, nice little break. And Helmeppo's like, oh, my life sucks. Why, Kobe? Why? You know, because he was like super pampered his entire life. And now he has to actually do labor. So this all leads into Morgan, who is at the base. I mean, they chained him up in the prisons at the base. Morgan is now going to be court-martialed. So Garp shows up. Morgan slashes him down, which Garp then just, he was asleep at the time, and he just wakes up, and he has this giant gash across his chest, and Garp is just like, oh, I guess I fell asleep again. Yeah, whatever, what can you do? That just, by the way, goes to show just how insanely strong Garp was, where even if, like, he... Like, some people might argue that. Like, in fact, hold on a minute. I think I might actually have uh, the diary of Kobe Meppo on standby because I did that video. I did a video on Kobe, and I did a video on Helmeppo back, so probably have it in those. Uh, it might be in Helmeppo's video, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, look at this. So, like, when, when Garp gets slashed... You might actually say, like, Garp is supposed to be so strong. Look at him. He's bleeding. Yeah, he's bleeding, and it doesn't matter. He wasn't using armament hockey, and it literally is less than a mosquito bite to this man. All right? <laughs> like, even if he doesn't use hockey, he's still the strongest. Okay? He is just flesh and bone. It's just it doesn't matter. It's not a wound. Any other human being gets a gash like that on him. They're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Not for Garp, though. Not for Garp. All right. So uh, the whole thing happens with him. And uh, there's a great little moment. It, this is more of a redemption arc for Helmeppo, honestly, more for Kobe. Like, Kobe gets some character development here where he helps out Helmeppo. He's just like, it's my friend. I, I can't have him die, please. He just picks up some pistols and just shoot. You're not going to hurt my friend. Bang, 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 bang. And it's like, okay, son. Okay, son. Calm down, son. Calm down. <laughs> you are not issued for that firearm, son. Calm down. And, um, you know, so this this is not like, I mean, it ends at the end of the cover series. You have Kobe and Helmeppo training with Garp, and they're definitely getting stronger. Uh, and they are working up. But it's not like they're badasses by the end of this cover story. It's more of just explaining a little bit more about their character development, how they became friends, how Garp met them, and was like, oh, I like your gumption there, you know? And then he recruits both of them. Ridiculous superhuman durability is limited to Big Mom and Kaido. People forget that. Yeah, I mean, like, it is absurd. Like, the way they talked about Big Mom was almost like, yeah, she's weird. Like, her body is like a giant iron balloon. That is not standard. Even amongst, like, the admirals, that is unusual. Her body is very weird. Yes. Um, they removed the gun from the anime. Yeah, they also, they also had, I guess, removed this awesome scene where uh, Bogar just shows up and cuts down the guns with super precision. Look at that. I love that. Dude, Bogart, people asleep on Bogart, man. I'm going to think I'm going to rank this high just because Bogart is introduced in it. Seriously. So Helmeppo tells off Morgan and uh, eventually uh, he, uh, Morgan escapes. I mean, he's in a raft and he just floats away on a wing and a prayer and he's, he gets away. We actually don't know whatever happened to him. Uh, Helmeppo and, and uh, Kobe, they begin to train under Garp. And uh, that begins their long, um, th their long training arc, <laughs> actually. And there's a lot more, but uh, it's revealed later, not in this cover story. But yeah, it's a pretty good one. I, I want to say I like it more than I like Buggies. Uh, and Bogard being introduced is awesome, so I'm just going to put it in Amazing. I, I really like this one. Atomic Slash! Bogart is so damn cool. I'm glad they used Bogart. You know, they could. that's the stuff about the One Piece live action that I really respect. I really do. Where it would have been so easy for them to just be like, okay, there's Garp's right-hand man. Who are we going to use? Ah, just pick some random Marine who gives a shit. No, Garp has a right-hand man. He might not be super relevant to the fucking story in the manga, but he has a right-hand man, and you're going to use him instead of some random Marine. They had Bogart in there, and I freaking love that. Okay, yes. All right. I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, Morgan probably opened a bakery. I, I do have a headcanon on what I think happened to Morgan. I think Morgan drifted to a, des not a deserted island, but he got to an island with a relatively small village. Like, there's people on the island, but it's not super bustling. 
he went into the mountains and he used his giant axe arm to like make a log cabin. So basically I picture Morgan just living the Thanos life. Like after Thanos snapped half the universe, he just retired to being a farmer. Like I don't think Morgan is trying to like build up like the Neo Marines. Like he's not Zephyr or something like that. I think he just lives in a log cabin out in the woods and just doesn't like nobody really like like every now and then maybe somebody notices him out there but nobody's going to go near him because nobody wants to mess with the angry mountain man with an axe for a hand so i i think he just lives in isolation honestly like if that was the way his story ended i'd be fine with it yeah he he just became a lumberjack yeah basically yeah uh or maybe uh if you ever watch G game of thrones uh sandor clegane how he kind of ended up like like maybe something like that a little bit you know uh, maybe, uh, being defeated messed up his, like, cause he was, like, hypnotized by Kuro to be, like, the greatest, like, warrior ever. Like, you are the greatest Marine ever. You captured Kuro of a thousand plans. And he's like, I am the greatest Marine ever. Maybe getting defeated by Zoro actually snapped him a little bit out of that. And so he realized, like, oh man, I'm not the greatest Marine ever. Okay. And, and maybe, yeah, he just retired to the mountains. Sure. Why not? Why not? Lumberjack Morgan. He's going to be the new uh, mascot for brawny paper towels. Okay, what's next? Well, next up, we have... Oh, this is a good one. We have Django's Dance Dance Paradise. Hey, if you ever wanted to know what Django looked like without his sunglasses, that is canonically what he looks like without his sunglasses. <laughs> It's time for Django! Do, 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 do. There actually is a Django's Dance Dance Paradise, and there is a cool song in it, and it, I forget the name of the band, but it's the same band that did the second One Piece opening, Believe. And um, there's a really damn cool song in there, and it takes place at Mirabal Island, and Django's dancing around like crazy, and it's it doesn't actually adapt to the cover story, it's something completely separate, but it is really fun to watch. It's like a little short, it's like four or five minutes long. It is really fun. Okay, so Django's cover story. All right, so Django was uh, defeated in the forest, uh, I believe, by Usopp. I think Usopp hit him with, like, an exploding star or something. Remember Zoro? I remember Zoro had to cut down a branch, and then that opened the line of sight for Usopp to get a hit in, and that knocked him clean out, all right? So the cover page starts with him waking up in the forest like, Whoa, baby, what's the going on? That wasn't cool. I got, I got knocked out, man. And so he goes up to the cliff and he sees the uh, the Benz in Black, the the cat, Black Cat Pirates, sailing away. So this is after the battle's over. Like, they have just been defeated. They got Kuro on the ship. They sailed away. And Django's like, hey, man, no, you left me behind, man. So he's on, Sir he's at Gecko, no, no, Gecko Islands at Syrup Village. He's still in Syrup Village. So he's just like, oh, man, what am I going to do now? I'm kind of hungry, actually. So he just goes back into the village because the pirates never actually reached the village. The straw hats stopped them before they reached the village. So the, the people of the village didn't even, I don't even think they knew that pirates almost invaded because, like, there was nothing to indicate that, right? They defeated them at the shore. So Django goes back into town, goes into the restaurant uh, where Usopp and the straw hats first, like, hung out. He goes into the freaking, like, hey, I'm hungry. Can I get some breakfast? And he's in there just eating breakfast or whatever. <laughs> and then Onion, one of the Usopp pirates, one of the veggies, walks in and sees him. And they're like, hey, you're the bad guy. And then, like, they chase him out of town. They're, like, smacking him with, like, fa like wooden swords. Like, get out of here. You're a bad guy. It's just like, hey, guys, calm down. Wow, what are you doing? All of a sudden, Django's, like, totally being overpowered by three children. Whereas, you know, he should be able to kill them easily, but just for the comedic, like, he, there's no reason why he couldn't just, like, kill all of the veggie pirates, you know what I mean? Like, he has razor-sharp chakrams, but, like, he's just like, oh, shit, okay, I'm out of here. And so he just gets on a boat and he sails away from Syrup Village. And he eventually, he goes to the place that everybody needs all the happening, funky, dancing people go to. He goes to Mirror Ball Island, which is a really cool place in the East Blue. And uh, he enters a dance competition. He, he disguises himself. He takes off his jacket. He takes off his hat. He takes off his glasses. He looks like this. He uh, gets a new outfit. He enters a dance competition, and he dances like crazy. Full Body also joins the same dance competition. They bond in the dance competition. Uh, Full Body loses. He gets second. Django takes first place. But they, they bond. They're like, man, that was the greatest dance routine I've ever seen. Yeah, man, you're pretty cool, too. And they're just hanging out, and they're 
broing love and all that stuff. And uh, they they're hanging out. And then that's when um, they discover Django's outfit. Like, you know, Django's on this island somewhere and Full Body's like, oh, we got to find him, right? And so you know, Django learns that Full Body is a Marine. And so it's like, oh, that's going to be complicated. So uh, I think some other pirates attack the island and that gives Django like the opportunity to get the hell out of there. So he's like, oh, okay, in the middle of all this chaos, when this other pirate crew attacks Mirabal Island, Full Body's busy dealing with them. I'm getting the hell out of here because I don't want to get I don't want to get captured. So he leaves, and he, he does get away. He gets on a ship, and he's leaving. But um, he go, he comes back to help Full Body with the pirates. Because one of the pirates took, like, a hostage, took, like, a lady hostage at, like, knife point. And Full Body's like, I don't know what to do. And then Django shows up, and Django and Full Body do, like, a combo dance move battle where they defeat all the pirates. And it's really cool. Like, back to back. They're like, I knew you'd come back. And he's just like, I know, but I'm a pirate. Eh, it's okay. We'll deal with it later. And they, they defeat all the other pirates. But then after that, Full Body does realize, hey, man, I'm a Marine. I have a duty to the world government. I have to take you in. I have a duty to justice. So Django kind of does, like, willingly, because he understood. Like, Django knew what he was getting into when he went back to the island. Like, he was probably going to get arrested. But Full Body's like, hey, man, I don't want to do this, but I have to. And so they he puts him in cuffs, and they bring them before the judge. And the judges are, like, very, like, this is a pirate. So it's like, what this son of a bitch do? The, your, this son of a bitch was a pirate, your honor. Okay, it's, it sounds good. Hang him. Yeah, just like he's just going to be hanged. Like literally Django is just going to be hanged. And so it's okay though, because full body shows up and full body and Django do a dance off in the judge and he gets acquitted on account of he's funky. <laughs> so next time you're in court, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, but if next time you're in court... Maybe you can get acquitted if you can dance really good. Like, the judge is up there like, okay, 17 accounts of murder and assault. You burn down an orphanage. How do you plead? I plead. Cue Dance Dance Paradise, Your Honor. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Just like, all right. Okay. All right. We like this. Your dance skills are off the hook. All right. You're acquitted. Get out of here, you, you crazy son of a gun, you. <laughs> No, like <laughs> footloose tear acquittal. <laughs> yeah. Peak fiction. Oh man. So the judges are dancing too. Like, ah, it's so just glorious. You know? Okay. So uh anyway. <clears throat> Uh, now, there is a little bit of a stipulation to Django's acquittal. He doesn't get off scot free, ladies and gentlemen. The acquittal terms are. He needs to become a Marine and also full body because full body is the one that's kind of putting his neck out for him. Full body has been demoted from a lieutenant to a seaman recruit. So they both go down to the earliest rank and they're going to be put under Captain Hina. And so um, they agree with it, obviously, because otherwise, you know, full body's like, yeah, I don't care. I'll take a demotion. I don't want my friend to be hung in the freaking square. So, yeah, sure. Well, I'll take it. I don't care. You know, that's the thing about Full Body. Full Body shows up in the anime at the end of the East Blue, and he's kind of like a washed-up has-been. But I, I don't really like that depiction of Full Body, because Full Body is actually kind of strong. You know, like, Full Body in this cover story basically takes out, like, a bunch of pirate, like, a whole pirate crew essentially by himself. Like, he's doing really good beating the crap out of these pirates, but then Django shows up. I mean, they, take, they take a hostage, and then Full Body's like, oh shit, they took a hostage, I gotta be a little careful here. And then Django shows up, and they all, they beat him. But, like, you know, Full Body is not, like, this washed-up has-been of a Marine. He's actually pretty, pretty tough. And, um, he's actually at a higher rank now. Because of the two-year time skip, they're both, I think, um, lieutenant commanders now. Like, the highest rank of commander, highest rank of lieutenant. Okay, so Full Body was, I think, just a normal lieutenant at Baratier, and now he's a lieutenant commander, so he's actually higher of a rank anyway, so they made it back up pretty quickly. Uh, full uh, Django is as well. They're the, they're the same rank. Uh, yeah. So at the end of the cover story, though, it's really funny, because there's a moment where Django is about to hypnotize Full Body. He's like, like, I think you would be better off just never knowing me, like, like just forgetting about it, like, 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 just, like, let our friendship go. So I think Django's about to, uh, well, no, I think what he's actually trying to do is maybe to leave, because Django's like, okay, I'm saved, but I also don't want to be a Marine, so I'm just going to hypnotize you into forgetting about this, and then I'm just going to get the hell out of here. I'm going to skip town, right? 
Uh, however, right before he hypnotizes full body, they see Hina. And, you know, hold, hold on a minute. Let me pull it up here. Um, oh, wait, actually, do I have an image of Hina with Helmeppo's folder? I do not. Okay, hold on a second. I'll go into the Marines. It is pretty handy that I do have, when I did those Marine videos, I have, like, every single Marine in one single. Okay, here we go. Da -da 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 yeah. Oh, wait a minute. No, there's a, there's a better one. Hold on a second. There's one from Film Z, I think, of Hina that's really nice. Wait, no, that was 20. Awooga! Yeah, they basically have an Awooga kind of, like, Looney Tunes moment, definitely. And, uh... Yeah, here she is. Yeah, I mean, like, if you see Hina... <laughs> It's like, I don't want to be a Marine. I thank you for my life. I'm getting out of here. Oh, wooga, pretty girl. And then so then, yeah, uh, Django's like, well, okay, I guess I'm a Marine then, man. <laughs> I guess I'm a Marine now. All right, why not? Who cares? You know, it's a new chapter in my life. Um, <laughs> you know? All right. So uh, there we go. Uh, what's with Robin? I don't know. People told me to put Robin at the bottom of the screen. I asked what to put down there, and people told me Robin. And this is the first Robin that comes up when you click him into Google. So there you go. Anyway, yeah. Django's Dance Dance Paradise, though. Uh, where are we putting this one? I, I like it more than Buggies. I like it more than Buggies. So we're, we're going to put him up there. Yep. <laughs> uh... Why does he sound like Joe Biden? Who, Django? I don't know. A lot of people said, like, Anchor Arms. There definitely sounds like a lot of Rustage D&D characters, what I was doing for Django there. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I'm getting Joe Biden. I'm getting Trump. I'm getting Anchor Arms. Like, hey, man, I'm just Django. <laughs> like, all right, all right. Why does Django have heart-shaped eyes? Hey, man, that's just... Dude, that's just how he was born, dude. You know, and, and the thing on his chin is actually a mushroom stock. You don't make fun of people's appearances, you know? Okay. So it's a pretty it's a pretty good one. I actually think I like it more than the Diary of Kobe Meppo. They're getting better. They're progressively getting better the more we go, okay? All right, number four, cover story. We got Hachan's Seafloor Stroll. Here's Hachi. Hachi and his lovely seafloor adventure. Okay. So this one, uh, this one's pretty fun. So it starts off with Hachi escaping the Marines that Karubi, Chu, and Arlong were all on, but we don't see them ever again after that, so whatever happened to them is whoever's guess. But Hachi escapes, he goes into the water, and uh, he basically, it starts with like him doing a bunch of random side quests. Like, there's a shark that has a hook in its lip, so Hachi removes it, and then the shark gives him food in thanks of that, and then Hachi has all this food, and then he sees, like, a shipwrecked sailor on an island that's, like, you know, starving to death, and Hachi gives that guy the food, and the homeless guy, the, 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 the shipwrecked sailor, is so happy, he gives Hachi a ring that he found, and the ring turns out to be a ring of the goldfish princess that lives in the bottom of the ocean in the goldfish empire. This is all canon. There's a goldfish empire in One Piece that exists. He goes down there, and the goldfish princess princess is like, I lost my ring. And then like, I found your ring. And then the goldfish princess is like, thank you so much. Here, have this golden trident as a reward. And then Hachi gets the golden trident. And then he's swimming along and he sees a giant sea monster about to eat a sea boar. The sea boar is like running from this giant monster. So Hachi takes the golden trident that he got from the goldfish empire. Are you following along with me so far? And he stabs the sea monster. So that, that stops it. And then the sea boar coughs up Kami and Papagoo. And then, and then the macro pirates show up, who are old friends of Hachi from back in the Sun Pirates days with Fisher Tiger. After the Sun Pirates, after the original Sun Pirates under Fisher Tiger split, they, they formed three factions. They, they, had, they had the Sun Pirates that kept going with Jean Bay, and then there was the uh, Arlong Pirates that, you know, Arlong headed up, and then there was the macro pirates, which are only like three guys. And so then Hachi meets them, and then they're like, hey, uh, Hachi... We were looking for that mermaid over there. We were going to sell her into slavery. Anyway, we found this map for the best takoyaki sauce in the in the entire ocean. Um, 
So uh, how about we trade the mermaid for this map? And then Hachi's like, yeah, sure, give me the map. Like, he doesn't even think about it. He just sells Kami into slavery, pretty much, so he could get a map to some takoyaki sauce. Like, we had, like, the, the whole start of this, the whole start of this cover story is, like, even though Hachi was a member of the Arlong Pirates, he's not a bad guy. He's not a bad guy, okay? The Fishman Pirates, sorry. He, he was okay with it. He was actually nice, a nice guy. Look at him helping all of these sea creatures. He helped, he even helped a human. He gave a starving human food. Arlong wouldn't have done that. Arlong would have cut the damn guy's head off and then ate him. You know what I mean? So, like, Hachi's, like, not such a bad guy. And then he sells Kami into slavery. <laughs> He's like, eh, whatever. I just met this mermaid. Who cares? Taco Yaki sauce. Take her. I don't care. I'm out of here. And then he just, he goes off searching for this Taco Yaki sauce. All right. So, <laughs> in his defense, Taco Yaki is really good. I haven't had it very often in my life, but the few times I have had it are very good. Yes. Mm. So... He follows the map, and it leads to a giant, like, sea octopus. Like, a giant, angry octopus. And, uh, Hachi gets pissed because he thinks he's been misled. Like, they gave me a fake map to a sea monster or something. Screw this! So he rips up the map and beats the shit out of the giant octopus. Which, by the way, he's an octopus in and of himself, so whatever. So anyway, he goes back, and Papagoo is there, and Papagoo's like, They took, they took Kami! They took her! And so Hachi doesn't even really, I don't even know if Hachi really cares about her at this point. He's just like, they, they swindled me, right? And so he goes after them. He beats up the macro pirates. He rescues Kami just kind of as like an ancillary thing and in involving that. He, he's pissed at macro, so he beats him up and beats up the crew. And then Kami just gets freed because of it. So then he's beating up macro. He's like, you lied to me. And he's like, I didn't lie to you. That was an actual map to the sauce. I wasn't kidding. And he's like, what? It just led to a giant sea monster. He's like, yeah, the sauce is inside of the sea monster. And Hachi's like, oh, oh, okay. And so he goes back to the giant octopus and no shit. There's like a hidden compartment. Like the top of the octopus's head opens up and there's a giant pot of octopus fritter sauce inside of it. And Hachi's like, I found the sauce! <laughs> he finally found the sauce, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody finally found the sauce. We've been looking for the sauce for 10 millennia! And Hachi finally found the sauce. Good for him. You know, for the sauce! <laughs> uh, now, also, while this is all going on, I should probably explain... That there is a uh, female octopus um, fish fish woman, okay, and she's been the object of Hachi's like affections for a very long time, and he's always been trying to impress her, and that's the reason he's going after the sauce because he feels like if he makes the best takoyaki, then she will accept his uh, marriage proposal because there's a little bit of a flashback where he proposes to her. And the takoyaki he made sucked. And then she's like, I'm never going to marry you. You don't make good takoyaki. And so Hachi's like, oh, I'm going to get her to, you know, see me as like, I I'll get her to marry me if I get her the takoyaki, right? This best takoyaki in the world, okay? Fishwife is one of my favorite words. Yeah, he wants a fishwife, okay? You know, don't we all? So uh, <laughs> Hachi uh, does manage to get the sauce. And then they stumble upon a village where this woman is. I think Octopaku is, is her name. And uh, she's, she's a rather conceited kind of character. Like, she's not, she's not the greatest. And there's an entire village of, like, starving uh, catfish. Uh, catfish. I, I don't know if they're, they're not really, I don't know if they're fishmen or if they're just, like, catfish that are, like, like, the goldfish people were not goldfish mermaids or goldfish fishmen. They were just goldfish that were, like, you know, sentient and, like, living in their goldfish empire, you know, whatever. So there's, like, a group of, like, catfish people, right? And so the catfish people are all starving, so Hachi gets there, and then him and Kami and Papagoo open up a takoyaki stand, and then they serve all of the uh, catfish people takoyaki. And then at the end of all of this, there's one... There's one package of takoyaki left. Like, they made all of it. All They're out of takoyaki except for one container. And Hachi's plan was to save the last order of takoyaki 
to give to Octopaku to, like, become his wife, like his marriage proposal, okay? And the implication is she's not really that great because she basically says, yeah, I don't care about you, Hachi, but I do love that takoyaki. And so the last uh, catfish guy shows up, like, he was an old dude, like, this old catfish guy arrives, and he's like, I'm sorry, I was late. Are there any, is there any takoyaki left? I would like some. I'm a brittle old man. And so Hachi does does indeed give the food to the old catfish man, which pisses off Octopaku and she beats the shit out of Hachi. But Hachi did a good deed. I think you're happier without her, honestly, dude. I think your life is better, okay? So, uh, yeah, 1,000 viewers. 1,000 viewers, yes. And so uh, they go back to the village and the catfish people are so happy, they build the uh, the ship. So if you see the ship at Sabaody, like Hachi and Kami and Papagoo's Takoyaki ship, that was built by the catfish people because they were so thankful. And so uh, that's the origin of that. And that's the end of the cover page where that leads into Sabaody later. Uh, and it also makes like a feud with him and the macro pirates. And that, that all gets tied up in the Sabaody Archipelago arc. Um, but yeah, that's... Um, yeah, that's that's Hachi's seafloor stroll. It's a pretty good one. It's a pretty solid one, I would say. Speaking of pretty solid, I think I'm gonna put it in pretty solid. I think I think pretty solid is pretty good for this. Yeah. Yeah, I I feel bad because he did basically trade like a mermaid he just met into slavery just so he could get some takoyaki sauce. You know, like it's like Hachi priorities, man. Yeah. This is my new favorite cover page. I gotta go read it. Yeah, true. Lower. Come on. I don't think it's I don't think it's bad. I think it's pretty good. I mean, like once again, it's either pretty solid or good. I liked it. I liked it, man. And they, but they still became friends. I think that's mostly just because Kami is um uh hold on a minute here. Let's see here. Uh Do I have an... Yeah, I don't even know if I have... I'm looking in the Fishman Island video to see if I have, like, uh, an image of Kami anywhere. I don't think I do. Yeah. Uh, but no, like, Kami is also kind of oblivious to things. Like, she's not stupid. It's just that she can be a little gullible with certain things. So, yeah. But anyway. Okay. Um... I need to, I, I'm hungry for takoyaki now. I mean, I live in the States. There's no one, there's nowhere around here that really sells takoyaki, but man, I would, I would love some takoyaki. Okay. So next up we have Wapples Omnivorous Hurrah. So let me pull that one up here. Okay. So this is the fifth one. So this is, uh, this is the cover story that like really shows that like kind of along with buggies, like Wapple. Okay. Buggy and Django are villains, but Wapple was, like, one of the first One Piece villains that's, uh, like, honestly horrible. Like, he doesn't even have, like, a tragic backstory that you could say, like, well, there, it makes sense why he does that kind of stuff. Like, no, I mean, he's just awful. He's just a horrible, corrupt king that wants to just ruin everybody's life, okay? And in this cover story, he actually rises back to power. So after being, um, I like to think because they were in the grand line, Luffy hits Wapple so damn hard at the end of drum Island. And they were so high up. He gets sent flying all the way into the South blue because that's where the dark, uh, the evil black drum kingdom is. And so I'm thinking he gets knocked so hard into the South blue. And then he, uh, spends a couple of days just tormenting random people, like, he just goes around eating random shit. Like, I'm gonna go eat a lamp and turn into a lamp. And then I'm gonna eat a bench and turn into a bench and just harass the townsfolk <laughs> by turning into random objects. Like, uh, hold on, let me see if I have the, uh, thing here. I don't- I don't have a singular, uh, collection of every single cover page, because there's a lot of them. But I do have, like, the Baku Baku video where I talked about Wapple- Yeah, here it is, here it is, this is funny. So, like, he turns into a tree- and he's just like, I am a tree. <laughs> and then uh, what's the other one? He's like, I will turn into a lamp. <laughs> and then he there's where's the one where he turns into a bench? That one's really funny, too. 
Oh my god. Uh, oh come on. Where, where's the bench waffle? Come on. There it is. I will turn into a bench. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Oh my god. This one is actually really disgusting because like you know that lady sat on that bench and then waffle just with his tongue just. <laughs> so anyway, as you can see where this is going, uh, he gets arrested. <laughs> <laughs> he gets arrested pretty damn quickly for devil fruit related harassment. Like that's you you can't be going around using your devil fruit power like that, man. That's you're you're gonna get your ass arrested pretty quickly. Okay? Yeah. Like he's being annoying at first, but I think that incident with the bench is like, okay, this this guy's uh, police, Marines, Marines, please. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets arrested, and uh, eventually he does get away, but he's basically living in, like, poverty, pretty much. And this is the worst thing for Wapple because Wapple is this super proud king, and now he has to live under a bridge eating garbage. And so uh, he does use his Baku Baku powers to combine all the garbage into, like, toys. So he produces toys... And the kids from the local community start hanging out with the strange homeless man in the junkyard. And uh, he starts selling the toys to the kids for like two berries each. Like it's super cheap because he just, he needs money to eat. He doesn't have any money for food. So he does that. And there's this dog that keeps peeing on him the entire time. Like he has this dog that just hangs out with him. And he actually eats the dog at one point and turns the dog into like partly cybernetic. Because the, the dog has, like, a robot head. So he eats the dog at some point and then spits it out. Yeah. So then, uh, eventually, though, one of the kids takes one of the toys back home. And his dad was actually a scientist. And his dad's like, hey, son, where'd you get that weird toy? It's made out of an alloy I've never seen before. So he analyzes the alloy. And it turns out it's made out of this super rare, like, alloy that doesn't exist anywhere else. It only exists because of his Baku Baku powers. And so Wapple um, becomes rich because he he basically created a new fucking element, you know? And so you see the dog there, and he marries Miss Universe, who's totally there just because of his money. That was actually shown in an SBS. Like, she's literally... Her, her laughter style is literally gold dig. <laughs> you know, like, gold, gold, gold. That's, like, literally keen, keen, keen. Like, like that's literally her laughter style. Uh, and so, uh, Kinderella is her name. Like, she literally has gold in her name. She's, like, gold princess, kind of. So, um, this is also the same alloy that, um, the Frankie Shogun is made out of. Like, literally, Frankie... By the way, Frankie never met Wapple. So, Frankie does not know that the Straw Hats interacted with Wapple, so they have no idea. Frankie just knows that there was this guy in the South Blue that developed this new alloy, and it's a really good alloy. So... Frankie bought a bunch from Wapple Industries and he used it to make, um, he used it to make the Frankie Shogun, you know? So, um, yeah. And now she believes that he cheats on him with Vivi. Yeah. So Wapple, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's his omnivorous hurrah. And then he becomes super powerful and he forms the evil drum kingdom and he becomes a new king. And, uh, that's where he's at right now. Well, not right now. Now he's uh, hanging out with Morgan's. But, uh, and Vivi, but that's his story. So it literally is a riches to rags back to riches story. And it's, it's crazy because like, he's a horrible guy and you don't want to see good things happen to him and, uh, good things happen to him. So it's like, wow. Okay. Um, it's an interesting story to show that like, you know, not, not I mean, like sometimes sh good things happen to shit people, I guess. Yeah. All right, um, Wapple's story, I'm going to say, is, I, I like it. I like it more than Hachi's. I think I might like it more, I think it's going to put it in the top of pretty solid. I think I'm going to put it at the top of pretty solid. Yeah. Um, I really hope, you know what, it's been said for years, they could just adapt the cover stories for, like, filler arcs. Not, they're not filler arcs, but they're canon, but, like, that's extra material you could add to it. And they don't really ever do it. I mean, Wapples got, Wapples didn't even really get animated, it was just, like, a series of images in the anime. It wasn't, like, a whole episode devoted to it. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up is, okay, next up is one of the weaker ones, for me, anyway. Uh, we have Ace's Great Blackbeard Search. So this one is, like I said, I, I'm probably going to put this one in just good. 
Uh, or really maybe even not my favorite. It's It really probably is one of my least favorite ones. Uh, just because there's, like, not much to it, really. So Ace is on an island. He's uh, dining and dashing. The uh, people on the island get mad at him, and they throw him into a river. <laughs> so he washes downstream, and then he uh, gets saved by Moda, who I guess... By the way, I guess this takes place on the Lelucia kingdom, because Moda is the farm girl at, at Lelucia. I don't know about Lelucia. I've never heard of Lelucia. I don't know what island this is. I don't even know if it exists, but uh, it's uh, it's this girl. It's this girl, okay? So Moda saves Ace, and she lives on a farm, and she's like, hey, I have a favor to ask of you. Can you help me? And she gives a letter to Ace to deliver to a nearby uh, marine base. Oh, by the way, I should also mention th another reason why he got kicked out of the town was because there was a doctor in the town that was Dr. Blackbeard. Like, his name was Dr. Blackbeard, but he wasn't actually Marshall D. Teach. He was just a guy. And so Ace kicked the shit out of him. And they're like, hey, that guy beat up old Dr. Blackbeard. He was our favorite guy. And then they, they pick up Ace and throw him into a river. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like, hey, this guy's kicking the shit out of the dock. It's like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, um... Uh, Ace gets the letter from Moda, and she's like, I need you to deliver this letter to the nearby Marine base, which is G2. So Ace infiltrates the Marine base. He disguises himself as a regular officer. He eats all the food in the cafeteria, and then he disguises himself as an officer in the Marines, and he goes into the meeting room. And this is uh, Vice Admiral Comiel is the uh, one that manages this one. I actually have his right here. Vice Admiral Comiel. We haven't seen a lot of Comiel, but I think he's supposed to be relatively strong. This is Comiel. This guy. So he's the commander of G2. He's a Vice Admiral. And uh, the Marine base has really shitty coffee. Like, their coffee just has no creamer, no milk, no sweetness, just bitter coffee. And so, I mean, you can't be successful Marines without good cup of joe, right? So, um... There was a marine vessel that showed up that got torched by pirates because Ace has made a fire. He's immune to it. So he jumps into the Inferno. He saves a bunch of marines' lives. He brings them back to shore. and um, But he loses his uh, disguise in the process. And all the other marines are like, Hey, that's Fire Fizz Ace! Second in division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates! Let's get him! And they start shooting Ace. And he's like, Oh, well, I guess I gotta get out of here. Oh, shit, sorry, I forgot to deliver this letter. So he delivers the letter to Comiel, and then he gets out of there. And so Comiel finds the letter, and it's like, Oh, this is where the milk is, okay. And so they uh, send some people to go pick up the, the milk from Moda, and it turns out that the people that are the, the galley chefs for the Marines were Moda's parents. So Moda is, like, reunited with her parents, I guess. I guess her parents were Marines, and they didn't come home very often. So Moda wanted to see her mom and dad, so she gave them the request for the milk. So they came back home, and then they're reunited, and I guess they're happy. And then at the end, this is the scene at the end where Ace is just like, Okay, we continue the, the search, I guess. It's just, like, it's it's... It's honestly not my favorite, really. Like, honestly, it's just Ace's... Like, like you know how Hachi had, like, five or six different side quests? Ace has one. Ace is, like, this is Ace's one side quest. Just that's kind of stretched out for a whole cover page. It's really not the most interesting one. All right? And it, it's not like at the end of it, it ties into anything else. It's not like, oh, we heard that white... Uh, we heard that Blackbeard was on Bonaro Island or something like that. Like... Nothing ties into it. It's just that Ace is just continues the search. Yeah. Yeah. It's simple but comedic. I mean, there's a couple of scenes with Ace when he's sneaking into the Marine base that I'm like, all right, this is kind of funny, but it's not really, it's not my favorite. Mm. It just shows he's still looking for Blackbeard. I mean, that's it. But we could, we can infer that after he leaves Alabasta. You know, we didn't need a whole cover story to tell us. By the way, he's still looking. It's like we, we already kind of knew that. It could have been something else. Uh, it would have been fine. But whatever. Um, Yeah, we get introduced to Moda, but, like, I don't really care about Moda. She's not a very important character. I guess she'll... Who knows? Maybe she'll join the revolutionaries and become a commander by the end of the story. In fact, I I'm saying that right now. Moda's going to be some kind of important character by the end of the story. Pro probably. Why not? Okay. 
So next up, we have Gedatsu's Accidental Blue Sea Life. This is one of my favorites. This is a really good one. This is hilarious. Okay. So after Gedatsu was beaten by Chopper, he literally falls out of Skypea. He falls through the clouds into the Blue Sea. He lands on an island. He just, boom! He just, like, plants, like, like face-first lands on an island. And there's a man on the island. I think his name is Goro. And Goro is working at, like, a hot spring. He's digging for hot springs to try to make a business. So Gedatsu lands there, and Goro pulls him out of the ground and gives him food, I guess. And he's like, well... I guess pick up a shovel and get to work, I guess. And so Geratsu is... He's an idiot. That's the whole point of Geratsu. He's like, Geratsu might be the stupidest One Piece character in the entire manga. Like, that's like... His thing is he's so stupid he forgets to breathe. He's so stupid he forgets to blink sometimes. Like, that's how dumb he is, okay? So Goro is basically just like, help me dig. And Geratsu's like, okay. And so they start digging... And uh, they eventually find this giant mole in the ground that's the Earth boss. And Gedatsu beats the shit out of it to be like, May I am the boss of the Earth. And then so the mole is like, Okay, you are you beat the shit out of me, so I guess you get to tell me what to do now. So they start uh, digging a bunch of holes looking for hot springs. Um, they also meet a uh, baboon that comes out of the forest that's like a carpenter. So he's the forest boss, and then Gadatsu beats the shit out of the forest boss, and like, I will now be the boss of the forest! I will be the boss of the entire East Blue! No, no, the, the entire Blue! All of the Blue! I will be the boss down here! I'm the strongest, right? So, um, okay. Alright, that's cool, I guess. Um, so, after that, uh, they get into the giant mole, and they start digging a tunnel... And the tunnel eventually pops out at Yuba, of all places, in Alabasta, where, like, Koza and Toto are. And it turns out Goro is actually Toto's brother, which would make him Koza's uncle. All right? So I love how Oda ties this all back together. So Gadatsu is now in Alabasta, and they meet him at Yuba, and they're like, yeah, we got hot springs. And so they basically go back, and the forest boss, the baboon, and his minions built an entire hot spring like, uh, you know, male bath, female bath. It's like a really... They built, like, an entire resort in, like, a day. And so they're like, all right, cool. I guess we have a resort now that connects Alabasta to a hot spring island. Okay, that's neat. So Scissors the Crab is, like, a ferry service that they have this tunnel. So people will get on Scissors and they, they'll go through this, like, underground tunnel, like a subway. And, and it connects them to the island. And so Vivi and Pell and Igaram and Terracotta and uh, everybody get on the crab. And they go to the island. And they go into the bath. And uh, that's the end of... <laughs> that's the end of it. And at the end of it, it, it zooms in on Gedatsu. And he's like, I am now the boss of the Blue Sea. And then it cuts to, wait a minute, I'm the boss of the reception desk at the bathhouse what and then that's that's the end he he wanted to become the boss of all of the blue but he became a rece he became the front end receptionist at a bathhouse <laughs> that, that is peak writing oda that is peak writing you son of a bitch <laughs> that's why i made Gedatsu the thumbnail too this is the best. This is one of the best ones. <laughs> he just becomes a receptionist. He's not even the owner. He's not even the general manager. That's Goro. He's just the front end receptionist. He's the guy that gives you a complimentary towel and a map of the entire resort. That's his entire job. <laughs> and he probably messes that up on a daily basis, but he tries. <laughs> <laughs> he climbed his way down. Well, honestly, he, he did better. Hey, man, he's doing a good, honest day's work for a living. You know? Yeah. He's the boss of the entranceway. <laughs> hey, he's doing fine, man. Good for him. He's making an honest living. I'm sure Goro pays him well. And here's the thing. You can get away with paying... Go you could pay Gedatsu in rocks if you wanted to, and he could probably fall for it. But Goro seems nice to him. I'm sure they give him actual payment. You know? Yeah. 
Oh, and berry are worth way more than X toll. It's like it's like ten thousand X toll to like a berry or something. It's an absurd exchange rate. One berry is what is the exchange rate? It's crazy. Like from the perspective of Gadatsu, he might be being paid like millions of like millions of dollars in comparison. Um, an X toll is, yeah, 10,000 per one berry. Holy shit. That is an absurd exchange rate. No, it's 10,000. <laughs> so literally, Goro could pay this man in like five berries, which is nothing. It is like less than a penny probably, but to him it'd be like, oh my god! <laughs> Inflation be wild. I'll tell you, those exchange rates, man. Yeah. He is the richest Skype, and I think he is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's not going to... Goro's not going to fire him. He helped him build the entire freaking facility. He can't be trusted to be anything more than the front-end receptionist, and even then, he probably messes it up a lot. But he can't fire him, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's, so the resort is not in Alabasta. It's a separate island that connects to Alabasta with an underground tunnel. So it's Alabasta, like, adjacent. Yeah. I hope Gedatsu shows up again someday. I hope they go to the bathhouse at some point. Yeah. All right, all right. There's Gedatsu's accidental blue sea life. Okay, next up is um, Miss Golden Week's Meet Baroque. And there's Miss Golden Week. Marianne is her name. Dressed as an... Uh, living her dream as an expert painter. And I think I actually do have... Because uh, I did a video on Miss Golden Week a while ago. So I think I have some of this one as well. Uh, let's see. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got most of it, actually. Okay, good. So, uh, this one actually starts, um, wait a minute. Do I have, do I have the one with the house on it? I don't think I have the one. Okay. So this is something else that I love that Oda remembers shit about his stories. Okay. Like the, 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 the detail at the beginning of this, I actually really love for continuity's sake. Okay. So, um, remember, okay. So at the end of Little Garden, Miss Golden Week is knocked out. Mr. Three leaves to go bring the message to Crocodile. And we all know what happened with that. Mr. Five and Miss Valentine are also knocked out. And they're on the island. They don't, the Straw Hats don't take them with them or whatever. They're on Little Garden as the Straw Hats leave, okay? So we actually start with, remember that wax house that Mr. Three made with his powers that Sanji gets the phone call from uh, Crocodile in? So uh, Miss Golden Week... Uh, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine are living in that house at the beginning of this cover story. They're living on Little Garden, basically like the Flintstones. You have Mr. Five. His name is Jem. And then uh, Mikita is uh, Miss Valentine's name. So they're like li they're like living on this island like the Flintstones. And, you know, like like Miss Valentine is like, like Wilma. She has like a giant caveman hammer. And, and Jem is eating this giant hunk of meat. All right. You know, so they're, they're hanging out there in this island on the jungle because whatever. And uh, they get a newspaper from uh, they, they get a newspaper and they find out that um, that the different Baroque Works members, I think, are going to are arrested. They, they, they find out the events of Alabasta occurred, like Crocodile was defeated, that their operation Baroque Works is no more and that they're all in prison. So she uses uh, her paint powers on a pterodactyl to get them uh, to get them off the island so they all fly away on the pterodactyl i think it's uh greenish yellow means friendship it's not one that she used during little garden so they all they all hop on a friendly pterodactyl and they fly away to try to rescue their friends yeah and uh they're flying and they get uh they get sucked into a storm and the paint washes off so they land on vacation island uh, the place that her and Mr. Three were actually vacationing at before Little Garden. They they land there. Uh, this also ties back to Django because uh, Hina, Full Body, and Django are on the island as well as Marines. And I don't have the whole thing here. 
but they uh, they all disguise themselves. The disguises are not good. Mr. Five literally has a five tattooed on his chest. This is not a great disguise. Hina's not an idiot. They figure out that these guys are Baroque Works agents pretty damn quickly. Uh, shenanigans ensue. Mr. Two Bonclay is also there. Mr. Three is also on the island after he escaped from Alabasta. Um, Mr. Three and Mr. Two get, uh, get attacked and get, uh, detained by Hina using her, uh, Oro Oro no Mi powers, her, her iron chains. Um, but the others do manage to get to the prison. They do manage to infiltrate the pit prison using Miss Golden Week's, uh, paint powers. And they do find, uh, you know, Miss Doublefinger and Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas and Crocodile's in there too. And Daz Bones is in there too. And they're like, we're going to save you guys. And, uh, they all escape. Except for Crocodile and for Mr. One, they decided to stay behind for whatever reason. But they all escape the uh, area. Mr. Three and Mr. Two also get thrown into the jail cell because they got captured after. So as they're all leaving the island after they're leaving, Miss Golden Week uses her ultimate technique, which is Rainbow Colors Trap, which allows everybody to live out their greatest dream, the thing that they always wanted to be, uh, they will get an outfit that rem that replicates that desire. So with the rainbow colors trap, uh, we get to see the ultimate dream of all of the Baroque Works members. And it's actually really cute. So Marianne becomes just an expert painter because she wanted to be the best painter in the world. Uh, Drophy, who's Miss Merry Christmas, becomes a princess. And uh, Miss Doublefinger, Zala, she just wanted to keep being Paula. She wanted to be Paula of the cafe. And so that's what she becomes. She even, Mrs. Golden Week's power can create coffee. It's the ultimate ability. Love the videos. Thank you for being you. Thank you, Anthony, for the 20 doll hairs. Mm. Thank you. Then uh, we also have Gem of the Border becoming a firefighter. Mr. Four becoming a pizza delivery man. Mikita becoming a baker, becoming a chocolate tier. And then we have uh, Lasso the dog becoming a tank. And that adorable. And then the colors trap also extends to the prison. Mr. Uh, Mr. One and Crocodile decided just to stay behind. They're like, we don't want to leave. We just don't feel like it. I don't know why Crocodile felt like getting sent to Impel Down, but he didn't mind, apparently. Uh, and then he broke out of Impel Down later, so why? Why did Crocodile like, I don't feel like breaking out right now. I'll break out of prison when I damn well feel like it. And I guess he did. So you see, Crocodile's ultimate dream is to become King of the Pirates, obviously. That's a dream that he himself probably gave up a while ago, but that is his ultimate dream. So it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a look see into Crocodile's like psyche a little bit. He he wanted to be King of the Pirates just like everybody else back in the day. And then Mr. One wanted to be a superhero. Cause Supa Supa no me is the name of his devil fruit in the Japanese, the dice dice fruit. Supa Supa no me. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Maybe getting saved by a little girl is too much for his pride. Okay, so, oh yeah, I mean, she is a little, she looks like, Marianne is 29 years old. Okay, she's, she looks like a little kid, but she is 29, but maybe it's the, it's the message of the thing of just like, no, getting saved by a little kid, little kid or being saved by my underling, that's, that's too much, you know, I'm not getting saved by them, I'm getting saved by, if I'm gonna get saved, it's gonna be by my worst enemy. <laughs> like, Luffy's gonna save me and nobody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought she was 20. Now she's, canonically it was revealed. Yeah, she's she's like 30 years old. Yeah, yeah. Where is that said? Uh, it's in one of the Viva cards. Um, but anyway. She is, oh my god, everyone's, everyone's a little bit, okay, hold on, let me just double check really quick. I'm pretty sure she's like in her 20s. Uh... Miss Golden Week is, according to it... Now, the Viva card might not be 100%. Oh, wait, no. Oh, she was born on April 29th. I was like, okay. I was mixing up two numbers there when uh, you're dealing with these numbers. Okay, yeah, she's 18 right now. She was 29. She's not 29. April 29th is her birthday. Okay, there it is. Because Golden Week was April 29th. Okay, there you go. All right. A lot of numbers to keep track of in One Piece. Yeah. Uh, dwarfism is strong with her. Maybe she, I don't know. I don't know if she has, maybe she is, uh, a, I don't know. But, uh, there is the correction, yes. 
That's something I always double check before, like whenever I use, um, what is it? Uh, whenever I make a video on like heights or anything or a character's uh, age is I will have to double check the wiki on that. I'm, I'm pretty good at remembering most things. But uh, when it comes to straight up numbers, because we know where I'm not great at numbers, when it comes to dealing with numbers, I always forget shit. Yeah. No sexy thumbnail. Nope. Just get Atsu. Just get Atsu's smiling face. Yeah. All right. G don't diss get Atsu. He's very sexy. Damn straight. <laughs> okay. So moving on. Uh, oh, yeah. I have to rank them. I guess uh, for Miss. Golden Week's Meet Baroque Operation. Uh, I'm gonna put her at... It, okay, it... The first chunk of it is not super great. The, the, the best part is at the very end, when she makes all of the Baroque Works agents, like, their, their, um, their best, uh, dreams come true. That, that's the best part of it, but that's, like, the last three chapters of it. Oh, and they also, by the way, go off, and they form a new spider cafe... And uh, that's where they're all working right now. Like, that's where all they're living. They're they're living there. And then we all know what happened to Crocodile and Mr. Three and everybody. They all got sent to Impel Down, and then they all broke out. Yeah. Uh, firefighters also control fires. Yeah, I mean, like, you could make the argument that, like, Mr. Five being a firefighter is not the best because he starts fires. But you could use fire to put out fires sometimes. Yeah, controlled fires are sometimes necessary, yeah. I would put it at the top of pretty solid. See, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it being in good. I think about putting it in good just because of the last three chapters. Yeah. All right. But the next two that are coming up are the are amazing. Yes. Next up, we have... Eneru's Great Space Operation. Bam. Look at Eneru here. Okay, I'm going to put this in best before we even, we, 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 we could talk about it, but like it's going to go in best, like it is going to, okay? So Eneru goes to the moon, his fairy verth, his endless verth, whatever you want to call it, it changes depending on the translation. He goes up to the moon, which you could just do in one piece, you could just float up there, there's nothing to like prevent you from going up there, you can breathe on the moon. He goes up to the moon. And uh, he looks around at this endless, like, I imagine he would get bored with it pretty quickly, but he's like, ah, yes, my endless vath. He looks around. He finds this old robot that's, like, dead in a crater. He electrocutes it. It comes to life. And it's just kind of there. And it's just kind of like, okay. And then a space pirate shows up and attacks it. And then Eneru's like, okay, whatever, I don't care about this shit. And then the space pirate attacks Eneru, so he electrocutes it. And then he sees a giant explosion in the distance, which that's what makes him mad here. He's just like, an explosion? Who's blowing up my fairy verth? This place is mine! So he goes over to see what's going on. And it turns out there's space pirates. There's aliens that exist in One Piece. Like, this is canon. Hold on, I have a, I have a picture of the moon here. I did do a video on the moon. I did multiple videos on the moon. The moon! Going to the moon! The moon. The moon! Is it made of cheese? Okay, so there are space pirates that exist in One Piece. They are like fox, furry, aliens kind of thing. That's the guy with the top hat there, the Dr. Seuss looking dude. That guy's their captain. So space pirates. Uh, and they're doing this mining operation on the moon. They're, they're mining something. We don't know what. Uh, Eneru's pissed because they're, that's his moon. I mean, he owns it, right? As soon as Eneru lands on the moon, it is therefore his place. It is his property, okay? Uh, so then we have a little bit of a flashback with the guy. His name is, I think, Lieutenant Spacey. So we have a little bit of a flashback of the little robot dude and how he was born. Uh, so this is, uh, Dr. Skumi, uh, and he lived on Karakuri Island, the same place Vegapunk was born, uh, same place Frankie gets sent. So Oda kind of ties all that back together. So he's a scientist on Karakuri Island, and he's working on uh, all of this stuff. And he makes four of them, so he had brothers. And one night while they were looking at the moon, they see an explosion on the moon from the mining operation. So Prince uh, Dr. Skumi dies, he chokes on a rice ball, and because he's dead, 
his four creations are like, we must find who killed our father. And then they float up to the moon because of that. They're like, we will find what killed our father. And so they get a bunch of balloons and they float up to the moon to the moon because you could just do that. They find the space pirate guy. They fight him. They all get their asses kicked. They all lose. So they all get defeated. They all power down. And uh, that's when Enaru, like, found him. So then, Enaru shows up and defeats all of the space pirates in, like, one attack. Because he's fucking Enaru. He's the god Enaru with the Goro Goro to me. He just runs over to their operation and just nukes them with one attack. So he kills them all. Uh, they're dead. <laughs> they're just dead. And then... You know, there are the other the other uh, automatons, and they're just like, hey, please, please save my friends. And then Enaru just electrocutes all of them. <laughs> I don't know if he was trying to save them or not, but he electrocutes all of them all the same. You can, you can notice a thing here with Enaru. He keeps he keeps electrocuting people. <laughs> he keeps he keeps electrocuting just whatever enters his field of vision. Alright. So, yeah. And then uh, afterwards they find the tunnel that Enaru, uh, that they were digging through. They, they find the tunnel. So he goes into the tunnel to see what's down in the bowels of the moon, and he finds an ancient city. It's an ancient city that's in the moon, okay? And once more, this ancient city's name is Bierka, which is the same place that Enaru came from that he destroyed. So it has the same name as the place that he was born. How does Enaru respond to this, ladies and gentlemen? Now let's, uh, hold on a minute. Let's, let's think about this for a moment. Enaru's track record here, okay? How does Enaru respond to finding a giant city under the moon that has the exact same name as the place he was born? Okay. So Enaru electrocutes the city. <laughs> Why? Why do you electrocute? Why, Enaru? What's the point? What's the point of electrocuting the city? What do you get out of it? It's a city. So he electrocutes the city. But it actually works out because the city does have, it, it powers up the whole damn city. And there's also automatons that are in the city that are different from the automatons that Dr. Skewmy built on Karakuri Island that went to the moon. They are different, but they look the same. So that's another thing to keep in mind. <laughs> All right. Zappy Zappy. <laughs> he could have just gotten some water first. Damn. <laughs> So he electrocutes the city, it powers up the whole damn city, and Enaru now has an army of automatons. Okay, so good for him. <laughs> he has an army. Probably not the army he would have expected, but he has an army. Alright. Okay, and then, the most interesting part of the entire cover story is we get to see two murals. Two murals on the island, on the moon. And the captions explain that these murals depict the original inhabitants of the moon. They're all winged people that lost resources on the moon. They could no longer power their city. Their city runs on electricity, so maybe there were fossil fuels on the moon. Maybe there were dinosaurs on the moon at one point. Why not? Anyway, they ran out of power. They ran out of, of fuel, of material. So they had to leave the moon and descend to the earth. And so that is the origin of the Skypeans, the Bierkins, and the Shandorians. The Shandorians made it all the way to the surface, all the way to the Blue Sea. The Skypeans and the Bierkins stayed in the sky. And then the Shandorians got shot back into the sky with the knock-up stream. It's this whole convoluted thing. But that's the reason why Kalgara, even though Kalgara lived on the Blue Sea, he still had wings. That's the reason. So they're all from the moon, okay? Enaru is too. He just ripped off his wings for some reason. Um, and replaced it with the Tomie pattern, okay? Because he's a god, I guess. I don't know. So we see these murals, which are very important, I am sure. Enaru doesn't care. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's the end. Enaru has an entire army and a powered-up moon city at his disposal now. The Enaru forces are now ready for battle. And that's where we have Enaru. That's where we leave off Enaru's story. That's how Enaru's story ended. A lot of lore there, guys. A lot of lore. Deep lore. Deep cuts. Oh, man. What's the point of wings if they can't fly? Might be vestigial. Vestigial wings. You know, why do humans have an appendix? Vestigial, probably. You know? Who do you like more, Zora or Sanji? Probably Sanji. He was my favorite straw hat before Frankie showed up. 
Hmm. So, uh, yeah. That's Enerus. I mean, he's in the best category. I mean, it's not even a debate on that one, but it is it is a fascinating theme. It is a fascinating story. I, I just I just can't wait for Enaru to invade the earth with an army of tiny little automatons at his side. Like, behold, the Enaru forces. Da, 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 da. Aw, they're so <laughs> look at them. You know. <laughs> Yeah, they probably used to be able to fly. Yeah, probably. That's what I mean by vestigial. It's probably just like they used to be able to fly at some point. Oh, I, I, I'm looking in the moon video I made, and apparently there, I remember this. There was an anime that was called Bodacious Moon Pirates or Bodacious Space Pirates at one point. And, and I like included, I remember I included scenes from that anime in this video. Bodacious Space Pirates. All right. All right, anime. You, you do that, anime. All right. So what's next? Next is, oh, Cypher Poll 9, the independent report. All right. This is another really good one. Okay. Um, so CP9. All right. So Cypher Poll 9. Uh, after the events of Eni's Lobby, where it got Buster called the shit, uh, Bluno was able to wake up after getting defeated by Luffy. He uses his door powers. He manages to get all of the Cypher Pole agents to safety. Now they're just stranded on the tracks outside of Eni's Lobby, on the C-Train tracks. They have nowhere to really go, so they just kind of wander the tracks. Lucci is in a straight-up coma. Lu Luffy knocked him into a coma, so he is completely unconscious. They don't know how to... They don't know how to... They don't know if he's dead or how to fix him or whatever, so they're just walking on the tracks. They eventually reach St. Poplar, which is one of the islands that the tracks connect to. That was mentioned at, at Water 7. So they reach St. Poplar. They do a bunch of, uh, like, street performing to raise money to pay for Saint, uh, to say, to pay the St. Poplar um, doctors to heal Lucci. So they raise all the money. Like, Khalifa does street cleaning, and uh, Jabra and Kaku do, like, they turn into their animals in the middle of the street. Like, so giraffes slide, and then Jabra's, like, jumping through hoops. Fun fact, this is, I think, the only time we see Jabra in his full wolf form. Because in, in uh, Eni's Lobby, we only saw his hybrid form. We see his full wolf, wolf form in this cover page. So after they raise enough money, eventually Lucci does regain consciousness. His treatment is a success. They hang out on St. Poplar for a bit. They go shopping. Pirates, the candy pirates, attack St. Poplar. Lucci beats the shit out of their captain, and he's really, really brutal with it. Like, he really k kicks the crap out of him. So the townsfolk are kind of afraid of him. Like, they save them, but at the same time, they're like, ah, I'm not really afraid about this guy. Lucci keeps, like, curb stomping the guy into mush. So then a, a little girl, though, goes up and gives them, like, a flower. Like, she gives Khalifa a flower. Like, thank you for saving us. And then Khalifa's like, aw. So then they get on a ship and they leave. And they go back to the island where they were trained on. They go back to their the closest thing they have to a hometown. So they go back to that island and um, Barry Good, um, one of the marine captains that was at Eni's lobby, he shows up to bring them in. They defend the island, they beat Barry Good back, they steal his ship, and they sail off into the sunset. Um, meanwhile, Spondum is still in the hospital after getting the shit slapped out of him by Robin. Very cathartic moment in One Piece. And his dad, Spondine, shows up. Now, Spondine is, is, uh, the, was the leader of Cypher Pool 9 during O'Hara. He was there during O'Hara. And, uh, he's the one that issues the Buster Call there, I think. So, um... At that moment, they're kind of like plotting, like we're gonna get back at Cipher Pool Nine at some point. And Lucci does a phone call over a Den Den Mushi to Spondum, and he just basically says, "One day we shall return." And they get on the boat and they sail away. Honestly, it raises more questions than answers because we cut to two years later. It it looks like they're defecting. They. They they defeated a marine captain. They get the hell out of there. They steal a navy vessel and sail away. And it's like, hey, uh, yeah, we will return one day. And it's kind of like vengeance, sort of. Like, we're going to come back one day and we're going to kick your ass, you know? And so they sail away and it's like, well, two years later, they're members of Cypher Pool Zero. Like, what happened, you know? Something had to happen where they were at least strong-armed back into the government somehow, you know? 
So there's a story here we don't know about yet. And I hope we find out about it. Maybe maybe we'll find out in Egghead because Kaku and Luchi are there. Maybe they found it. Hey, maybe the Gorosei got involved. Maybe the Gorosei got involved and are like, no, you're you're members of the government forever. You're members of Cypher Pole for life, whether you like it or not. Yep. So maybe we'll find out about that. Maybe Kaku will say something. Yep. But anyway, it's a pretty good one. Um, I'm going to put it as um, amazing. I'll put it up here. I think I think it's pretty damn good. I don't like it as, as much as Geratsu and Enaru's, but it's still a really solid cover story that, that really shows you a little bit more of how the Cypher Pole interact as like, uh, like family, as like their friends. Yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, next up, we have... Okay, so this is where we get into some of them that are like... Uh, what are they called? Like anthologies. We have the Straw Hat Separation Serial. I'm just going to use Robin as the thumbnail for this because, well, Robin. So this is taking place after Sabaody, after the Straw Hats are all separated, obviously. And Robin, uh, and not just Robin, but I have Robin on the brains. Um, so uh, all of the Straw Hats get two cover pages to where they're at. Now, this is expanded a lot in the anime. Where, like, we see them and, like, like like Robin ali arriving at Tequila Wolf and the whole thing with, like, Sora. I think her name was the little girl that Robin befriends on Tequila Wolf. Uh, and then there's, like, like in Weatheria, we see more uh, hijinks with um, uh, Haridus and Nami and everything like that. So they, they expanded a little bit in the, um, in the anime. But, yeah, Nami ends up at Weatheria. Frankie at Karakuri, all the stuff with Frankie drinking the the Dajong, the Dajong tea and becoming a gentleman that that doesn't happen in in the cover page. Um, Brooke gets summoned by a bunch of cultists. Um, Usopp ends up on the Boeing Islands. Sanji ends up on Kamabaka. You know, like we all we all know where they end up. Um, I, I I have to put this in best, pretty much. Like I have to because we get to see what the Straw Hats are doing. While this is happening, I like Enaru's operation more. I'll, I'll put it here. Uh, because we only get two chapters for each straw hat. It's not like, and it's, it's so it's two times uh, nine at the time here, I guess. So it'd be like 18 chapters. So it's a little shorter, actually, than most short term cover series. It's, it's not super long. Zoro's on Gloomy Island. Yeah. One day we will return. Two years later, they returned. Hey, Tekking, I hope you're having a good day. Happy, no April Fool's here. Yeah, April Fool's. Like, they are saying, one day we will return after our vacation, and we, we will expect a promotion. It's like, okay, maybe that was what they meant. Maybe, I always thought it looked like they were planning revenge, but whatever. Yeah, the Frankie part is the funniest, but only in the anime. It's not in the manga. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's good because we get to see what the Straw Hats are doing. It's Straw Hat focused, so how can I not put it on best? Um, although maybe it should be. You know what? If I'm ranking these, like, I'll, honestly, I think I'm going to put it down into amazing. You know, because it is, it is shorter than the other ones. It's not like we get, you know, uh, you know, a whole series on Robin and then a whole series on Sanji. It's just two chapters for each one. So, yeah. I'm, I'm going to put it down in amazing. Okay. And the next one is also one that is an anthology. We have the From the Decks of the World. And this is this is very difficult to put this in. Uh, I'm thinking of above Enaru or before because these are my two favorite ones. I'm just telling you right now. From the Decks of the World. And I'm putting uh I'm putting Ward and Hanyable in here, because that's the funniest thing, I think. Uh, Ward and Hanyable. Also, we have sexy chief guard Domino down there. <laughs> but anyway, so from the decks of the world is right after the events of the time skip. And Oda does this massive cover series where we see we go chronological order throughout the entire story and see what every single character is up to. 
What's up at Fuchsia Village? What's up at Orangetown after Buggy was defeated? What about Boodle and and uh, Chow Chow? Well, Chow Chow, they opened up a brand new uh, pet store in honor of their owner. What's up with uh, Kaya at Syrup Village? Well, she's training to become a doctor. What's up with the Bratier? It's under renovations. What's up at, Fu at um, uh, Kokoyashi? Johnny and Yosaku are ripped fishermen now. And it just goes through all... Gaimon got married. Gaimon got married to Garfunkel, who was a barrel girl. There's somebody out there for everybody, you know? It's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. This was honestly fantastic. It was so fun to that Oda actually took the time to be like, what is going on with all these inconsequential minor characters throughout the One Piece story? Where are they at? What are they doing? There's actually another one of these I actually skipped. There's another shorter one that occurred earlier that basically just shows what's up with the people at Water 7 and um, uh, Skypea. I skipped over that one, actually. I didn't put that one on here. Uh, but that one, was, that one was also very short. It wasn't a very long cover series. Barrel-chested, box-chested. Try treasure-chested. There you go. Yeah, Boodle is very important to the story. Yes. They the Boodle shows up in the live action and they look he looks exactly like he does in the manga. It's really funny. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, Hanyabul becomes the the warden of Impel Down. Uh Magellan becomes the vice warden. Uh uh Saldeth gains like he gains like 5 feet cuz Saldeth was like this little imp guy and now he's like like 8 feet tall. Um Sadie has a crush on on uh, Magellan, I think, is the implication. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. He learned the attack cuisine. He's used it twice, I think. He used it... He used the attack cuisine. One of them was the soup that he served at Punk Hazard, and another one was the cream that he used on the um, the wedding cake, I think. That, that sum sum cream or something. Yeah. Also, Mino Chihuahua was introduced to the Demon Guards. It's just, we go through every single thing, and it's so fun. And I think I might, I think this might be my favorite one. I think this might be, I mean, Enaruz is great for lore, but, like, I just love continuity. I love it when authors give a shit about the continuity of their own universes and care about their characters. That, like, what's going on with these characters we haven't seen in a while? I love that type of stuff. And Oda did this, and it was incredible. Yeah. So then we have that. Mm. Next up, we have Caribou's ki -hi 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 in the New World. Caribou. All right, Caribou. Cr crazy adventures with Caribou. Okay. So Caribou, after um, the Straw Hats leave him at Fishman Island, they beat the shit out of him, but they don't do anything to him. He tries to steal all the treasure. Luffy punches him. Gives the treasure to Peckoms, but then they just leave Caribou there. They don't. They don't give him to Neptune or. Oh, by the way, there's this guy. Like, no, they just beat him ass in town. And Peckoms also beats him too. Peckoms beats his ass too. But they just leave him there. So obviously, immediately after the Straw Hats leave, he goes back to his uh, kidnapping shit, where he goes around and starts trying to kidnap all the mermaids. But it's okay because Jean Bay's there. Jean Bay punches him. Then he takes him up to the surface in a bubble car and throws him over to G5. He's just like, hey, here's one for you, and just throws over Caribou into G5. Now, the G5 Marines are insane, okay? So they literally just grab Caribou, and they they tie him to a stake, and they start burning him, okay? And then they're just like, ha, 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 burn, pirate, burn, okay? Um, and then his crew show up. That tried to, this crew that weren't uh, dead. They, we thought his crew were dead, but they actually showed up. They rescued Caribou. They get out of the Marine base. A giant storm whips up. Caribou gets separated from his, his crew again. Caribou ends up on an island with an old grandma. An old grandma is there. And Caribou looks a lot like um, a Grumble, I think his name was, who was this old lady's grandson. So Caribou basically takes advantage of this older lady and is just like, ah, yes. Yeah, she thinks that dumb old broad thinks that I'm her grandson. All right, I'll just play along then. <laughs> and so he just, like, starts wearing her, her uh, grandson's clothing and starts eating her pies and just like, oh, I have a, I have a good thing here taking advantage of this old lady. 
you know. It turns out that Granbull was also the leader of a revolution. I don't know if it was tied with Dragon's Revolution or not, but connected. And they're also, by the way, living on one of island, one of the islands that Kaido uh, owns. So the island that Drake showed up after the time skip where Scotch was, the, the cyborg dude that Drake fights, that's this island that Caribou washes ashore on, okay? So, uh, Go uh, Gaburu, Gaburu, that was it, Gaburu. So, um, Drake shows up. <laughs> And he turns into a giant allosaur and he beats the shit out of Caribou and he drags him to Wano. So that's how he ends up in the Wano prisons. The grandma did, by the way, know that he wasn't uh, her grandson, but he just she just went along with it. Right. So uh, that's how Caribou ends up in Udon prison. Basically, that's that's the story of how that happens. Yeah. He does lead a revolution very briefly in this scene. He does become the leader of a revolution, but not for very long. It's it's it's. It's it's not my favorite. It's it's all right. I, it's I don't hate any of these. Keep in mind, but eh, you know, it's like okay, this is a story of how because I don't like Caribou as a character. He's a shit character. Uh, I'm not that he's he's just he's a not a good guy. He's a villain, but he's like that kind of villain that tries to like kidnap Shirahoshi, you know, and he uses mud to like drag them into his swamp, and he's just disgusting. And uh, yeah, he it's not my favorite. He killed Scotch. Oh, no. Whatever will we do? He killed Scotch. You know, there's two characters in One Piece named Scotch. It's very funny. And actually, there's two characters. Rock and Scotch. Scotch and Rocks. Rocks, Scotch. Morgan, Morgans. Osuru, Osuru. There's actually a fair amount of One Piece characters that have the same name. Yeah. They did. He did try to rescue the grandma, though. Yeah, I guess. But in terms of, like, the entire cover story and enjoyment, I didn't really care for this one too much. Speaking of Jinbei, next up is Jinbei's Night of the Sea solo journey. Oh, so this is what Jinbei was up to while the Straw Hats were in Dressrosa, basically. So Jinbei's adventure, um, it involves him... Uh, once again, kind of doing a bunch of random good deeds, like he's just sailing around the sea. Uh, he runs into a lost sea cat, and he's like, okay, we're going to find your home. So he takes the last the lost sea cat to a sea dog policeman, and they find their way back to a sea village where the sea cat lives. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, all right, I'm with you so far, okay. Um, th this one is the one, I, I, I don't remember this one super well. There's a point where... There was a town that was under siege by a bunch of sea monsters uh, because I guess they took some stuff out of a uh, sacred temple or uh, well, wait a minute. Oh, and hold on. Hold on. Actually, you know what? I'm going to reread this one. Let me pull this one up, actually. Hold up here. Somebody actually made an entire website focused uh, to the cover pages. So you can go look that up. I tweeted about it a little while ago. I don't know if... Uh, let's see here. Cover stories. Here we go. Uh, OPCoverStories.wordpress. Yeah, so go check it out if you just want to read through the cover page. Like, just the cover pages. You don't want to, like, go from chapter to chapter. You just want to read all the cover pages in sequential. This one I just don't remember a lot from. I just have to pull this one up. Let's see. We have Hachi's seafloor stroll, and then we have uh, Jinbei's seafloor stroll. Okay, here we go. Okay, so he brings the sea cat back to the village, but the village is gone. It's missing. That's right. The, the entire village just went missing. Uh, and then they see a bunch of rubble behind them. And they're like, okay, well, what's going on with that? Then they see a giant ship coming out from, like, up on the surface. Like, a bunch of random shit is just, like, falling from the ocean. So they go up to the top, and they see a shipwrecked boat. So Jinbei goes on the boat and saves everybody, because he's Jinbei. He also finds out that Luffy and Law have an alliance at this time. Um... And he also reads in the paper that there are sea beasts rampaging in a port town. And these are, I think, the same sea beasts that um, the uh, the guy that shows up at the beginning. Oh, what was his name? Uh, the the guy that tries to, like, like extort the Straw Hats before they get into Fishman Island. Robin beats him. His name started with the letter H. I remember that. 
His, uh, Harambe. No, not Harambe. Uh, it was the guy that, like, Robin beat during, um, Fishman Island. James? No, it wasn't James. <laughs> it wasn't James. Oh, what was his name? I remembered it for a long time, even though he was... Hammond. That was his name. Hammond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sad man. So, I think these are the same sea beasts that attacked with Hammond there. So, they go over... And they find out that the cat's village has somehow ended up on the surface. Like, like a bunch of buildings got picked up and got thrown onto an island on the surface. So Jinbei's like, what the shit? So he goes into the island and he's like, what's going on here? And um, he's like, suddenly the ruins destroyed our town. They're like, no shit. So the ruins of this city got thrown onto their town. So obviously it destroyed this island. It's like, what's going on here? I was like, okay. So then they find a temple in the middle of the ocean to the sea god, but the offering to the sea god is missing. Okay. Okay, this is making sense now. Okay. And it turns out, that's right, it's Wadatsume. So Wadatsume, after getting kicked out of Fishman Island, after getting uh, deported out of Fishman Island, he found the offerings to the sea god, so he took them, thinking that they were his because he is like an Umi Bozu kind of thing. Like, he's a big, giant dude. He's a pufferfish guy. And this one, we actually see a, a little mini comic of how everything happens. So, Wadatsume left Fishman Island. He found the offerings. He, he took them. And then he's like, wait a second. I need to thank those humans. I know. They gave me a gift. I'll give them a gift, too. So, he picks up a building and throws it at the island. <laughs> so... So it's like, okay, he's trying his best. And then Jinbei scolds him. He's just like, you can't be doing that type of shit. You can't be no more picking up priceless ruins and throwing them at towns. People don't really seem to appreciate that much, Watatsume. Come on. And Watatsume is like a little little child, basically. He's just like, I'm sorry, Jinbei, I didn't mean to. And so Jinbei's like, whatever. And the sea beasts got angry because the sea beasts were sleeping under the, the, the giant ruins. So Watatsume picked up the ruins and threw them. So the sea beasts got mad and the sea beasts started attacking the town because they thought the town stole their home. This is all one great big misunderstanding. All right. Well, eventually, anyway, uh, when Jinbei's in the town, uh, the people there also found a poneglyph because one the thing that was in the ruins was a poneglyph. Watatsume threw part of the like the town, so he threw the 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 poneglyph onto the island. So Jinbei finds a poneglyph, and that's what he does. He goes back to Big Mom and presents her with this poneglyph, and uh, that I guess Jinbei was hoping that would have been enough for him to leave the crew. Obviously, Big Mom is pissed either way. But um, this was what Jinbei was up to before he decided to go to Whole Cake Island, and then. Uh, I guess uh, Wadatsume's like, hey, I want to go with you, Jinbei. And then Jinbei and Wadatsume leave the island, and that's how Wadatsume joins the Sun Pirates, I guess. Okay, yeah, I didn't remember this one too well. I had to reread this one. Sorry about that. Yeah. Deported. Yeah, I mean, Wadatsume basically got kicked out. He got exiled. He got deported from the island. Bye. <laughs> so it's just a regular poneglyph, though. It's just a blue poneglyph. But yeah. So, okay. Um... It was good. It was okay. Yeah, I didn't remember it too well, so... I, I, I liked it better than Aces. There's a lot going on with this one. There's a lot... There was multiple panels there where they had to show, like, five or six panels in one panel from all the stuff. I think maybe Oda maybe made it a little bit too complicated and he had to, like, explain better because there's no dialogue in the actual panel themselves. There's captions, and that's it. So, like, I think Oda maybe made it a little bit so complicated he had to throw in a lot of, like, step one, two, three, four, five of what happened. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Uh, we got from the Decks of the World, the 500 uh, Barry Man arc. So this is after Luffy gets his bounty from um, Dressrosa, and uh, he defeats Doflamingo. He gets a bounty of 500 million. And everybody, it's the, it's kind of the same thing, but it's not quite as good. It's not as long as the other one. Oda doesn't go through every single, you know, incidental character. We don't go to Orange Town or whatever. But we just kind of cut to, like, the principal, most the most important people. Like, I love this one because it has Mihawk wearing that straw hat <laughs> as he's they're tilling the fields. Him and Perona are tilling the land. So it's not as good 
as the first decks of the world, but it's still it's still amazing. It's still pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of the same thing as from the decks of the world, so I'm not going to like talk about this one for too long. Um yeah, this one features like just some highlights I'll pull up from the uh thing here. Uh let's see, from the decks of the world. Okay. So this is the one we see I mean a lot of it's just like I mean, like, a lot of it's just, like, there's Crocus and Laboon. There's um, uh, uh, Genzo and Noji to Nojiko at Kokoyashi. There's Vivi and Karu going to Reverie. There's, uh, uh, at Water 7, there's Iceberg looking at Frankie's wanted poster, which is the Frankie Shogun at this point. And Iceberg is like, what did he do to himself? <laughs> Cutty Flam, is, the, is there no boundary you will not cross because they think the Frankie Shogun is Frankie? Yeah. We see Karakuri Island. We see all the cyborg animals cheering. We see Baltigo. We see Brooke's managers getting pissed because they basically lost their livelihood because Brooke left. <laughs> uh, we see uh, Heracleson returning to, well, not returning to the Boeing Islands. He's still flying around. Oh, we see Haridus and the other weather wizards. Uh, wearing super funky clothing because Nami influenced their fashion sense. So that was that was pretty funny. That was pretty funny. Mihawk and Prona are tilling the fields. Um, oh, at Kamabaka, we see Ivankov preparing a meeting. And we didn't know what that meeting was for the longest time. And it was preparing the meeting for the revolutionaries because after Baltigo was discovered, they had to go to Kamabaka. Yeah. So Rayleigh, Rayleigh is gambling. Rayleigh's just reading the paper and seeing Luffy as a 500 million bounty. He's like, ah, oh, good for Luffy. Anyway, I'll, I'll take five on the, the, I think they're playing like Han Cho kind of thing. So Rayleigh's just gambling as Rayleigh does. Uh, the, the monsters at Ruskina that Luffy like subjugated that made him his minions, like that giant lion and the giant gorilla at, at, at Ruskina are like, oh, our boss, he's doing well. Good. I think Margaret. I think Margaret went back and showed... Margaret went all the way to Ruskina just to show a bunch of wild animals that Luffy is doing okay. <laughs> Margaret is is a contender for Luffy best fangirl. <laughs> you know, like, there you go. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's good. It's not as good as the first one, but it's still, it's still amazing. Okay, what's next? Um, okay, another anthology. We have the... Anthology of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. So I actually went over this not long ago. I remember going through each individual Grand Fleet member like uh like a couple months ago in a live stream. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember going over all of these very, very recently. So I kind of don't want to go through every single one. Cavendish's is he tells the story about how he was so hot he got kicked out of his kingdom. Bartolomeo tries to sell knockoff straw hat merch to an island that Shanks owns. Um, uh, uh, Blue Gilly and IDO get involved in a race war between the Long Arm and Long Leg tribe members. Uh, Leo just, they get a ship. Um, let's see here. Uh, Psy gets married to Baby Five. And Orlumbus just retires from being an adventurer and becomes a full-time pirate and sails off into the Great Blue Sea. There we go. That's that. That's the uh, the adventures of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. We'll get to Super Chat by the end of it. I'm almost done. I only have three left, and uh, we'll go to Super Chat afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. They. Uh, yeah. Animal literacy is through the roof in One Piece. They they do care about animal literacy rates in One Piece. I will say that. <laughs> oh man. So um I I didn't like it on the same level as the first three. First one, like I love the decks of the world for world building purposes. I love Enerus for lore purposes, and I love Geratsus just for I think it's the funniest. I think the the comedic purposes of Geratsus is the funniest. So for that reason, I think I'm going to say it's pretty solid. I'll put it at the top here. I'll say pretty solid for the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. Yep. I can't remember what stream it was, but it was recent. I went through a whole I went through every single one of them in, in fairly decent detail. Yeah. Okay, we got two left. I'm not doing the newest one by the way with Yamato cuz it's literally only two uh chapters in, so we have no idea what's going to happen. Um 
Next up, we have G- Capone Gang Beiji's Oh My Family. So this is a family drama with Beiji. After the events of Whole Cake, uh, they're sailing around in a giant cupcake in one of the tart ships. And Beiji's like, this ain't my kind of ride. So I think they, uh, they attack a marine vessel. Uh, and they get the marine vessel. And then they're sailing around. And they eventually land at Dressrosa. Now, Dressrosa is still pretty damaged from the birdcage and everything. So they're on Dressrosa. They're there. Uh, this is also where Prince Gruus and Kujaku get introduced. Because uh, they're looking for uh, Beiji, I think. And they're on the island. They got, like, word that Beiji was on the island. So they're there. And uh, Lola is also on the island as well. And Lola gets confused for Chiffon. And it's, like, a whole thing. And eventually, like, like there's, like, a good chunk of this where it's just, like, you're Lola, you're Chiffon. And it's, like, they're, they're confused. Gotti, who is one of the, uh, one of, like, uh, not, I don't think it's his first mate, but it's, like, his second mate. It goes uh, Capone Beji, and then Vito is, like, his right-hand man, and then Gotti uh, is his, like, second in command. And so eventually, you know, uh, he meets up with Lola. They fall in love, and uh, Pound shows up and then reveals that he's the father of Lola and Chiffon, and they're like, what? And they, like, leave for a bit, like, get, the way, get away from us, crazy old man with a giant head. Like, they run away. But they eventually are convinced that, like, no, I'm your dad. And so then they end up getting a happy ending where Capone is married to Chiffon and uh, Gaudi gets married to Lola. So she finally gets married after, like, a thousand marriage proposals. And Pound is there to walk her down the aisle at the wedding. And that's that's the story. <laughs> that's that's the cover page, basically. Um, it's a little bit, like, Pound, him being alive in that is just, like... He really should have died. Oven had him dead to rights. Oven picked up a flaming Naganata and was bringing it down on Pound's neck. And Pound was like looking away, like crying, like, I'm happy I helped my daughter get away. And he like accepted his fate. Like he knew he was about to be beheaded by a flaming Naganata. But he accepted his fate and he saw his daughter leave. And he's like, I finally helped my daughter. I can die happy now. And then somehow, some fucking how, he avoids the critical hit from Na- of a flaming Naganata from Oven. And then ends up floating on a piece of driftwood. And then he makes his way all the way to Dressrosa. Okay. Okay, sure. Why was the Ace cover story your least favorite? I just didn't care for it. It's not my favorite. I just, I thought it was kind of boring. Ace brought some milk to a marine base, I guess. Okay, good job. The power of love. I was like, okay. Oven rolled that D20 and rolled a one. Okay, I believe that. Oven rolled, it's like, he had advantage too. He had advantage on, on attacking pound and he rolled a double crit fail. Hey, we've all been there. We've all been there, man. That's fine. I That makes sense. Fine. Double crit fail. Stabbed himself in the foot. All right. No, no, no. I agree with you. Pound deserved a happy ending. But don't put him, like, dead to rights. Just have him, just have him be there saying goodbye to Chiffon. And then maybe have a moment where, uh, maybe not Oven. But maybe have a moment where, like, uh, like some other kids of Big Mom that we don't really care about. Because Oven is, like, one of the stronger ones. Have it be, like, I don't know, um, Charlotte, like, like, Nutmeg or something. Like, Nutmeg shows up to attack him. And then maybe, like, okay, Pound could beat Nutmeg. It's like, okay, sure, I can believe that. You know what I mean? Like, some random member of the crew that nobody cares about. Or Yuan or something. Don't have it be Oven. Yeah. Yeah, Prince Gruus and Kujaku and the Golems got introduced here. Although we didn't know they were Golems at the time. Yeah. Did you make up Nutmeg? Nope. Nope. He's a child. He's a child of the Big Mom family. He is, um, I think he's 17 years old. He was born right before, no, right after the, uh, no, right before the deck uplets were born. Because all the deck uplets are 18. And then Nutmeg was 17. And then Pudding was 16. And then Flampe was... 15 because they all like I remember them all sequentially for a while there Mascarpone and Jascarpone are 22 uh Lola and Chiffon are 28 I'm not great with uh character ages and weights as not weights heights as we all know here yeah 
Yeah. I Somebody actually on the wheel. I don't know if I put it on the wheel. Maybe I should put it on the wheel. Um, and we're going to spin the wheel at the end of this, by the way, to see what we're talking about next. But on the wheel is also what we're going to talk about next. And somebody recommended putting all the discuss all the Charlotte children. Now, Too Spooky already did a really good video about that like a few years ago. So I feel like his video was perfect. I don't think I need to really add to it. Um, wasn't Nutmeg one of the deck uplets? No, Nutmeg is... I can show you a picture of him. Nutmeg has, like, his uh, outfit is kind of, like, uh, based off of, like, I think, like, uh, it's kind of like a Shandorian outfit. Here's, uh, oh, wait, no, Nutmeg. I'm thinking, damn it, I keep messing up my One Piece characters. Man, you are witnessing, no, Nougat. I was thinking of Nougat. Ah, man. Nutmeg was one of the sip was one of the deck uplets. She's a woman. Yeah, I man, I am messing up my One Piece characters today. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm losing my One Piece street cred right now. I was thinking of Nougat. Yeah, Nougat's the one that was dressed like a Shandorian. Yeah, and he's 17 years old. Yeah, I got that right at least. Oh my god, I am just not with it today. This is Charlotte Nougat. This is who I was talking about. Pound could have beaten this guy after it gets distorted because of the stupid file format. Hold on. Convert. Okay. That's Nougat. All right. This is Nougat. All right. And then Nutmeg is one of the deck uplets. So she's one of the ones that does, like, the fusion dance. She doesn't have the fusion fruit, but um, the deck uplets all fuse together to make the giant deck uplet at one point. Yeah. This is Nutmeg. Please just do it right. There it is. So that's that, There you go. There's Nougat, and there's Nutmeg. They were only born a year after each other. But, yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So, like, somebody like that character... I guess Nutmeg, too. Like, if it was Nutmeg against Pound, I believe Pound would be able to beat Nutmeg. Yeah. Fusion, ha! Yeah, hold on. I, I have the Fusion. I did the Fusion video. The Fusion Fruit is wild to me. I still love that I used that ability. I rolled that ability in One Piece D&D &D and me and Virilium fused. Uh, me and Ver uh, Verona fused to Virilium. That was probably one of my favorite favorite moments in One Piece D&D. &D. It was so good. Here are the deck uplets. Here's all the deck uplets. So Nushi is the biggest one. He's in the back, and he has the uh, the fusion fruit. This is the big guy on the right. And then they, they all fuse together, and they make this thing for some reason. Ooh. So, yeah, it's pretty neat. We all love fusions. I actually hope that fruit comes back at some point. I don't know how it would, but I hope it does. Charlotte, Nuichi, Nuji, Nusan, Nushi, Nugo, Nutmeg, Akimeg, Almeg, Harumeg, and Fuyumeg. Their, um, their names, so the, uh, the males are obviously all named after numbers, one, two, three, four, five. The, um, children, the, uh, the, da the daughters are all named after, so Nutmeg is obviously a spice. But then the other four are named after seasons. Aki is fall, Almeg is, I don't know what that, well, Haru is spring, and Fuyu is... Uh, winter. So Almeg would be summer, but Natsu is summer. So I don't know what the... No, maybe not Nutmeg, Natsu, and then Almeg is all seasons. That's it. That's the reference there. There you go. I know, I know One Piece! Guys, believe me. Trust me. I know One Piece stuff. I know random One Piece facts. I haven't lost it. I know it. I know the stuff. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Meg from the hit show Family Guy? Yeah. 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 They look like angry Namis. They all kind of look the same. Yeah, I gotta gotta be honest. Yeah. Oda had to design 87 children, and like not even half as many of them actually were relevant to the story. It was very impressive that Oda was able to do that. Maybe I'll make a video on Big Mom's family, but I won't go through every single child. Maybe I'll just do like a few of the most notable ones. Because Spooky, Spooky did an amazing video about that. Go watch it. It's really good. It is a little outdated, though, because at the beginning of that video, he does suggest that Kaido and Big Mom had... the Because like, that was a theory for a while. That Katakuri might have been Kaido's, like, son um, before we knew what their relationship really was. So that's a little bit of a... You know, like, because we just didn't know at the time. Yeah. 
that just shows dedication to the story. He also came up with like 35 islands, and most of the islands didn't even show up. Oda is committed. Just like how Tagashi made an entire card game and most of the cards weren't even relevant to Greed Island. I love that shit when you come up with a manga, man. All right, well, anyway, where are we putting Beiji? Um, good. Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. Okay. Coming now down to the last one, at least the last one, because the current one uh, is in development. We have the Jerma Double Sixes Emotionless Excursion. This this one just wrapped up not long ago. And you know what's funny? Most of it is not even about the Jerma. The, the beginning part is about the Jerma, and then the second half is about more about Judge and Caesars and Vegapunk's relationship to Mads. Okay, it, it really doesn't focus on the Jerma siblings after the halfway point. Uh, Reiju and Ichiji were able to escape with Judge, but Niji and Yonji were trapped. They got captured by Big Mom's crew, and they got put into a book by Mont Dor. And Oven is about to deliver Ni uh, Niji and Yonji over to the uh, Big Mom pirates at Whole Cake Chateau to be experimented on and, like, vivisected, okay? So, at the same time, we have uh, Van Auger and Aokiji showing up at Chocolate Town. They defeat Cracker, they freeze the island, and they steal pudding. They steal, they steal their world supply of pudding. They steal, they kidnap pudding. And uh, while that's going on, Ichiji and Reiju break into Whole Cake Chateau. They rescue Yonji and, and Niji. Uh, Caesar's also there because he just couldn't find a way off the island because they're in the, not just like getting off the island, they are in enemy territory. They have to like, getting out of Whole Cake Island is not good enough. You have to escape Big Mom's territory and that's really hard to do. So Caesar tried to leave, but he couldn't. So he was like, shit, all right, well, I guess the, the, the last place they'll think to look for me is at the chateau. So I'm going to go back there and hide and then wait for my opportunity to get get out of here somehow or whatever. So he runs into Reiju, they run into the Jerma, he uses their uh, his hallucinating gas on Katakuri and Oven, so they start fighting each other, so they get away, they escape, and then when they all get back to the Jerma ship, that's when Judge sees Caesar, and this starts a whole flashback of Mads, and Dufeld was their original financier, uh, financer, and then we also saw that Buckingham Stussy, uh, you know, Miss Bucking was also an original member of Mads. We saw Queen there as an original member of Mads. Judge in his younger days. Um, and they're all making their different forms of science. Like Queen's working with like his viruses and Judge's with his weapons uh, and all that kind of shit. And um, yeah, so it's it's not super revolving around the Germa siblings, but we had like a whole flashback with them. So you don't really need that. But overall, we learned a lot about Vegapunk, and we learned a lot about Mads here that we probably... Maybe Oda's like, I can't include everything about Mads in the story, so we're just going to have it here. Yep. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm going to put it at either the top of pretty solid or maybe an amazing. There also might be some recency stuff with it because it just happened. You know what? I'll bump it up to amazing because we did get some world building out of it. We did get some world building stuff out of it, like big time. We got some Vegapunk backstory stuff. I'll put it in amazing. Yeah, that's that's pretty good with me. So at least we filled out every tier. That's good. We have uh, three in best, most in amazing. That's pretty good. And there's only the only two I really didn't care for were aces and uh, caribous. And then Beiji's and Miss Golden Weeks and Jean Bay's were like, eh. And then uh, the other three, I think, all fit pretty good. As like, I really love reading all of these cover pages. Absolutely. Neo Mads probably pissed that Vegapunk's been killed already. Yeah, they might actually show up and be like, "We're here to kick the shit out of Vegapunk. He's already dead." What? <laughs> Did you see the animes making him say Quasar more than the manga? Yep, and I'm happy about it. The last one was really cool. I'm I'm loving the the egghead music, like the OSTs that they played when they were waking up the Seraphim. It's like this really intense, like 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 sci-fi, like do 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 Seraphim one, Seraphim three. I'm like, it's really intense, like battle music where you could really feel like like it's like like Shaka is like activate battle protocols, and it's like a really cool scene here. Where, like, Egghead is getting ready for battle. All the Vegapunks are mobilizing. All the Seraphim and Pacifista. Oh, man. That was a really cool scene in that episode. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, there it is. There's the cover page uh, rankings. Um, hope everybody agrees with it. And then if you don't agree with it, then get out of here. I'm just kidding. You can stick around. It's fine. 
Uh, we're going to check out some Super Chats, and then we're going to read... Uh, or we're going to spin the wheel. We're going to spin that wheel to see what we're talking about next time. So uh, let me go back to this view, and then we can check out Super Chats here in a second. This was a good This was a good one. This was a fun one. There wasn't as many to discuss, but it also still ended up being like, yeah, about two hours. Yeah, no. Yep. Showed up at the ending. Let's spin the Wheel of Fortune. All right. Well, we will. But first this. Okay. What do we got here? All right. Get Hachi the W. He gave up the girl to be kind. He did eventually give up the girl. Yes. <laughs> he did eventually get up, uh, get over Octo Piku or uh, Pikachu. He got over Pikachu eventually, as we all do. Love the videos. Thank you for being you. Thank you, Anthony, for the 20. Uh, I'm a little late, but thanks for all the entertainment throughout the years, Teching. You're the real Joy Boy. I don't, I'm not the real Joy Boy. I know Joy Boy. He has a YouTube channel. I also know Joy Girl. She also has a YouTube channel. By the way, there was a video that she put out about uh, all the different, uh, like she asked me and a bunch of other YouTubers to talk about their favorite um, backstory in One Piece. And I picked Brooks and I talked about Brooks. So go check out her video on that recently. Damo Dash, can we get Jinbei Straw Hat vid during break? I need to do his. I definitely need to do his because I did all the other Straw Hat discussions and his needs to come out at some point. Maybe we can add that to the wheel. I'll, I'll add that to the wheel. That needs to be on there. Who do you like more, Zoro or Sanji? I care more for Sanji just because he was my favorite Straw Hat before Frankie and Robin showed up. So, yeah. Fly me to the moon. I don't remember the lyrics. But I'll sing it in the cadence of Sinatra. Yep. Lucci, one day we will return. Two years later, they returned. The prophecy has been fulfilled. Thank you, $5, for uh, Project Iceman. Um, that guy, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Tech, it was mentioned that every crewmate of the Red Hair Pirates can be captains of their own. What if the reason they were so strong is because they all have conquerors? It was mentioned that in terms of the average bounty, Shanks' crew has the highest out of all the Yonko fleets. Like, his crew has the highest average bounty. So that means Ben Beckman... Like, Shanks' bounty is over $4 billion. Ben Beckman's might be over 3 Even though, like, a lot of other Yonko commanders were always around $1. You know, like, Katakuri was $1 billion, $57 million. Kings was, like... Um, one billion seven six 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 six, five, five, six, eh, six or seven hundred million something like that. Marcos was like one billion eight hundred million something like that. Like what if what if Ben Beckman's is like two point five billion? Like the highest out of all vice captains, something like that. Like is probably most likely. We just don't know what they are yet. Um, sorry for the off topic, but Frankie and Robin are your favorite Straw Hats because I'm here in Japan going to be in Kumamoto checking out the One Piece statues, and I wanted to buy you two of the limited figurines. I mean, if you sent me a limited edition Kumamoto One Piece statue figurine or something, I would not say no to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hunter Jaeger, because that, that would be awesome. I need to go to Japan at some point. I'm going to London later this year, and that's really going to be fun, but I need to go to Japan every uh, at one point with the boys, with, like, Rustage and everybody, because he's been there a few times. Need to go to Japan, and I need need to visit Kumamoto and I need to make the pilgrimage to all the different One Piece statues. <laughs> like, we got to do that. Uh, I like this cover because Caesar got a happy ending. Yeah. I mean, Caesar's not the best person to get a happy ending because he experimented on kidnapped children. But, you know, I get I get the impression. For a fun video idea, what if Zoro died and Queen had joined? That, oh, I read that as fun video idea. That wasn't... Okay, I'll make that as a fun video idea. What if Zoro died and Queen had joined Luffy? All right, we'll do that. <laughs> hey, Teching, this is a stretch. But I think Mars York scene last chapter was a reference to Prometheus. I mean, it could have been. Oda does fit a lot of random mythology references there. Um, I'm not really sure. I think it's going to end up with York working for the government and then like Lilith and Edison working with the Straw Hats. So obviously they so both groups don't have an advantage. Each group has a Vegapunk, you know. Uh, what if what is Kami and Papagoo's relationship? They're just friends. I think. No, wait. No, Kami is is Papagoo's employee. Papagoo is Kami's boss. Papagoo lives in a fucking mansion in Gilverly Hills. He created the criminal brand. He is like a fashion like 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 guru or something. He shows up on on talk shows talking about like how great it is to be the fashion guru of the entire fishmen and merfolk. Prometheus stole from the fire from the gods and gave it to humans. Then he was chained to a rock and attacked by a bird. York, you could say, is the opposite. Well, yeah, York is definitely chained to a rock and being accosted by a giant bird. So I can see it. I can see it there, yeah. 
think it's all the yeah, it's all the super chats there. Thanks, everybody. King's Bounty is 1.3. Okay. I was thinking of like, was King's Bounty higher or lower than Marco's? I think Marco's was higher. Marco's, I think, was closer to 1.5, if not higher. Um I'm still curious about Beige getting sucked up by those ships. Um, could have been, uh, it could have been the mother flame. It could have been something relating to Eneru, or it could have just been a flying boat. Who knows? He's her sensei. Yes. Oh, Marcos was lower than Kings. Huh? I could have sworn Marcos was higher for some reason. See, I'm not great with numbers today, man. I'm all over the place. You know, I'm all over the place here. I'm getting nutmeg, confused with nougat. I can't think of King and Marco's bounty. I'm off my game today, man. This One Piece, like, One Piece has been on break for only, like, two weeks, and I'm already completely out of it. <laughs> all right. Well, let's spin that wheel. Let me pull the wheel up here, and then we can spin said wheel, and we can see what it lands on. I'm going to add Jinbei to the wheel if I haven't already. All right, Jinbei video, because that needs to be on there. Okay. Okay. Wheel time. It's time to play the What Will Teching Be Making a Video About Next? Do, 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 I forgot to take off the tier list video, but what what are the odds I'm going to roll the exact same video again? You know, I forgot to take it out, and it's too annoying to remove it. So we'll just hope that doesn't land on that. Let's spin the wheel. Spin D wheel. Okay, we're doing a video. This is not a live stream. This will just be a video about, and this was all recommendations from you guys, by the way, so thank you for that. We're going to be doing a video on Bello Betty's Cheer Cheer Fruit. Uh, very fascinating devil fruit, actually. Very, very cool power that doesn't actually do anything for Bello Betty, but actually always empowers people. And it's actually kind of the opposite of Perona's um, uh, Horo Horo no Me, because the Perona's ability, like, makes everybody depressed, and Bello's Betty's empowers people. So you gotta actually think about, like, what that really could entail. Like, how could that be utilized? Like, the people of Lelucia got stronger because of that. Like, Moda got stronger because of that. They were able to beat back the pirates um revolution yeah and also we could use it as just a general video to discuss bello betty because bello betty is she's she's a cool character we don't know that much about her although she did show up at kuma's backstory actually you know yeah and we could also maybe talk about Ginny because Ginny was also part of the east commander army so we'll just probably do a video on bello betty and we'll talk about Ginny and also her devil fruit involved like as we do this yeah People of what? Yeah, some island. You've never heard of it. It doesn't matter. About time she got a video. Bello Betty. She resembles... Um. Hold on a minute here. I'm, I'm thinking for a moment here. Uh, do, 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 You know what? I'm just going to do this. She does not have a video. No, I, I've never made a video on her. She's a boss. She really is. The French Revolution. My God. Bello Betty is one of those characters, though. Like, the, the amount of boobage that is spilling out, I'm even hesitant to put, like, the, the, like the, the picture of her that's on the wiki is, like, maybe too much boobage for YouTube. I'll, I'll use this one instead. I'll use this one instead. <laughs> She has liberated from a... She's liberated herself from wearing a bra. Because, yeah, she does not wear a bra. I imagine there has to be a lot of double-sided tape going into that outfit, though. Either that or... Nope. <laughs> Either that or she uses armament hockey to keep her boobs in place or something. There, there we go. There's Bello Betty. That's a, that's a good, safe picture of Bello Betty that I could throw up. I love her hat. It has like the little devil horns coming out of it. Yeah. Yep. 
Any chance you can review My Hero Academia? Uh, maybe. I don't think I will, though, for this stream. I mean, for the, uh, for the break, though. It's best to keep it, like, one piece on the channel. I might make a... Like, when My Hero ends, I might make a video about it then. Her costume is probably even more unpractical than Rebecca's. Yeah, I mean, like... Yeah. I mean, Rebecca's outfit kind of falls into the whole trope of... In a video game, when you're playing, like, an RPG, like, uh, um... Uh, Viva La Dirt League even did a sketch about this, where you get, like, badass armor on a guy, it's, like, super tough, like, covering every inch, he's like, yeah, Deathbringer armor, but then a woman will get, like, a female avatar will get an outfit, and it's just, like, the, the diamond breastplate and the adamantian thong, <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, like, that's more of a trope if that, if nothing else, sexy gladiator, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, so there, there's some stuff we could talk about Bello Betty. We'll focus on that and then her Devil Fruit and Ginny and a little bit of the backstory with the Devil Fr with the uh, Revolutionary Army and everything like that, yeah. What do you think the Awakening of the Yomi Yomi Nomi is? Um, it might be what Brooke has right now, the ability to freely control your soul. That might not be a given. Like, the idea is Brooke had it for 50 years and he never had that power, and now after being freed from the Florian Triangle, maybe he was able to uncover the real powers of that fruit. Because uh, it's weird to me, because it's mentioned that during the two-year time skip, he began to pray, and that was when he learned about the true power of the fruit. It's crazy he never undercovered it in the 50 years he was on the ship. I guess he was just too depressed to pray. Because like, like he just like he prayed, and that's how it happened. So it's like, hmm, I wonder how what happened with that, you know? But anyway... That's the video. Hope you guys enjoyed the stream. I gotta go brush up on my One Piece lore, guys. I need to go and read up on, like, every... I need to name every single Charlotte family member in order and give all of their ages in, in descending order. I need to read up on the heights of every character in the Imperial and the metric system. I got some homework to do, okay? Uh, thank you for the TED uh, super sticker at the end here, Chasse. Thank you so much. You guys have a good night. And uh, we'll cut, cut back to a video next time. And then we'll spin the wheel at the end of the video and see what we're doing after that. Later, everyone. Signing out.